All right, welcome to NK Live, the show where I get the industry's brightest minds here and flagrantly copyright infringe on their brands and intellectual property. So, ZK, Zach, Kenny, I will never do that again when you're not here. Thank you for joining. That's all right. <laughs> um, I appreciate you making the time. I like interviewing people like you who, who don't really need much of an introduction, and we can just get down into it. And the reason I'm excited to talk to you today is because I think we both have a lot to say about the really specific business process of creating business processes and coding and going down that rabbit hole. And I feel like I've heard you express a lot of interest on it in a lot of the interviews you've done with these really high caliber guests that you've talked to. But I want to hear what you think about it. And I think it's cool that we're both doing a very similar thing from a very different perspective. Uh, you're doing very world-class work and working on retroactively encoding a little bit while I'm still at that really ground level, me plus one other person, as I'm building that out. So I'm excited to go down that rabbit hole with you today. I do want to get into a little bit of like biographical stuff with you, but through that very specific lens. So coming up, I think we've all heard some version of your origin story, but coming up, did you ever really exist in a well-run, organized, professionalized paint business? Was that part of your experience? Uh, um, no, like, I, as I would c categorize it today, I would say no, I did not. I was I was part of a company that that did run pretty pretty. Uh, uh, my boss ran a pretty tight ship. It was pretty well organized for the industry. Um, I sure didn't have any like SOPs written that he didn't have anything written down that we were referencing, but you know, we had a pretty structured day, a pretty structured environment. Um, and I think he was, you know, he was running a business that was five, four or five painters and, and he was doing a pretty good job. He was pretty on top of that stuff for a paint contractor, but nothing like some of the guys that you mentioned earlier and nothing like what I want it to look like today. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you talk about kind of being trained, just like thrown in, yelled at, sink or swim sort of thing. Um, oh, yeah. So you never had like a formal apprenticeship learning anything like that. Yeah. Same here. Not even close. Yep. What was the catalyst for you to go out on your own? Um, simply, I was probably not a very good employee. I wanted freedom. Oh, I needed freedom. Um I, I wasn't, I, I just wasn't not a stable person with like a steady Eddy mentality. And, and so, you know, working for myself, making my own hours, all, you know, that was cool, man. And uh, it was mostly out of just pure necessity. When I started out, it was pure necessity. I, I moved home very abruptly to be with my family and I needed someone, I needed to put money in the bank so I could eat kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it was just someone paid me $15 an hour to paint a flip house. And that's, that's kind of how it started. Mm -hmm. Not intentional at all. Sure. So probably weren't putting any business structures in place. Weren't thinking about it at that level. How long was that phase um, before you started adding people? I would say I have no idea, but I would say I'm really bad with like the past I couldn't tell you what happened last a year or two or three years ago. It's all the same thing to me. I, I, I it's just the thing about me. I don't know what happened in the past. I couldn't tell you. Um, I said something the other day about something I thought was nine years old. And then my wife was like, it had to have been at least 13 because of these, these facts. And I was like, Oh, okay. 13. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> I would say for the first year or two, I was probably me and like, my brothers would help in, out here and there. Um, but I, I was like, I was bringing people on into the mix pretty quickly. Um, you know, in all the worst ways you would do it uh, mm -hmm. in all the standard ways of putting ads on Craigslist, paying people cash, having these transient people coming and going. Um, I wanted to leave them like on the job site the whole time. And I would just, I would leave and like nothing would get done. And 
I mean, I've made every mistake in the book. It, it was really, I was not very mentally fit when I started all this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that was several years of that. Can you just generally walk us into when the modern ZK started to kind of crystallize and form? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think I, it, I can't continue this conversation without at least the, inf- the, the real inflection point was the day that I got clean. I, you know, I'm an addict in recovery. I was smoking pot and, you know, taking Adderall every single day for up until five and a half years ago. So, mm. you know, more than anything, like that's the main inflection point where I could like start to be a normal human being and like not be intoxicated. Um, but the inflection point is, as far as like trying to make a business happen probably came a couple of years after that. Um, yeah, that's probably safe to say about four years ago, I made the transition to only using fine paints of Europe and, but even that was, you know, we weren't, I would say in the last two years, we've started to make some inroads at professionalizing the back, the back end a lot more. Mm hmm. Uh, remind us when that kind of exponential IG fueled growth curve started for you too. Was that, that three ish years ago? I would say it started two, two to three, two years ago. It probably started two years ago. Um, and in the last, I don't know, year, six months to a year, it's really taken off. It's, I can't, I mean, it's like at the last, the last two months have been un- unbelievable at, you know, the rate that what the demand for our services is so high. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for it. It's crazy. Of course. So let's, let's go back to that like two ish years ago, Mark, how many people did you have then? Let's see, two years ago. I don't know. I probably had, I could have had four people, mm-hmm. probably about four people. Okay. Three and four. were those blank slate, decent human being types or painters? Uh, no, they were of all painters of some sort. Um, there was, let's see, one guy had been with me for a long time, painted for a long time. Very, very talented guy. Um, and then there was, let's see. There was another girl that she came in with a couple years experience. She, but she was comfortable on a brush and and a roller and sandpaper and stuff. Um, and then right about that time is when I brought on my first person that had no skills. Um, he's with the company today. Mm -hmm. Uh, and actually just got a big race today and, uh, he's going to be taking on some more. He's now out of his apprenticeship. Cool. Um, He's officially a painter. Um, and he's come a long way, very talented, man, very talented guy, young, young kid. And, um, then we had, I brought, when Phil came into the company, he, he had skills, Mm -hmm. um, for sure. So at that point, you know, you were doing fine paints then you had a collection of people with some experience, at least mostly how, how were you? training, communicating job expectations, uh, you know, facilitating the, the production of some of the highest class work that we can do in this trade. What did that look like for you? Um, yeah, like it was a lot of, a lot of direction, broad direction. Um, some, so a couple of guys, Arturo was the guy who'd been with the longest. He had like, he knew kind of how we did things because I had worked side by side with him um, for a few years. So he, he had been there, he had seen it. Um, and I, I worked side by side with them a little bit in the early stages, not two years ago. I was, I don't think I was doing much two years ago, but I had worked with a couple people, um, that were there. And so then there was just a lot of guidance as far as like verbal and it was all verbal. None of, none of this is written down. Um, mm-hmm. It was just verbal, like, okay, you know, we're going to look to do this. They would do something, give feedback. Um, very, very informal. Mm-hmm. But 
was it more or less working? Did you feel like it was messy or stressful at the time or at that level was it more or less working? I felt like it wasn't so bad. If, I think if you ask the people that were doing the work though, they probably would not have they probably would have said it was it was more stressful than uh, I perceived it to be. Mm -hmm. I think How that you... really good people, the type of people that are really good at, in like my greatest employees, like they don't do well in that type of environment. Um, great attention to detail, reliable employees, not not people who want to be owners. Mm -hmm. The mentality that comes with that is, you know, it's a steady eddy type of person who wants to like have a lot of structure and a lot of um, clear things and not a lot of floatiness or variables that change on a dime or, you know, and so for me, I, you know, I thrive on chaos and have for a long time. And so I didn't, nothing bothered me. I, in fact, you tell me like, we got to get this done. Like that probably got me excited more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But what I came to realize is as I hired more and more, as my, every employee I've hired from the start till now, like they're better and better and better and better and better. Right. Just like all the jobs we do keeps getting better and better and better because I'm building a better organization that can attract and retain better people. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I started to realize like, oh man, like I'm not gonna be able to keep these people around. You know, they're stressed. I'm hearing things like they're not happy. Like I, I gotta do something. Mm. Um, so that was, that was a couple years ago. Okay. So that was more, less client feedback and more employee feedback. That was that bigger wake up call then? I would say none of it's ever come from clients. Okay. Um, I have, I have generally, I have obsessed on delivering results oftentimes at great expense to the company. Mm -hmm. uh, but results have never wavered. Like they're always the, the way I got to where I am is, is first and foremost providing world-class finished product, you know, on every job. Mm -hmm. Um, it sort of started there. So the clients, I don't think were as much of the driver to this as like, I'm not going to have anybody that works for me yeah. if I don't change something. How many, it sounds like you've retained several through that phase. How many did you lose through that phase and realization process? Um, I mean, I, so it's interesting because it's, this has been, it's one. So I would say even three years ago, I probably had this, this realization or four or five years ago, I understood somewhat what needed to happen. Um, the, the difference between knowing it needs to happen and actually doing something about it, you know, there's a huge, and I'm, you know, this is, the, this is why we're talking about this topic. I think, I don't know if it's why, but I, this is not my strong suit. Um, no, by any means. Nope. And so, I think I I was triaging my business and putting out fires and dealing with the, the worst, loudest things. And so oftentimes with my charisma and my passion, I was able to sort of get away with bad practices internally in my company. And people stuck with me longer than they wanted to because they liked me. Mm -hmm. and, and they liked working. They liked me as a person. They didn't like working for me. And, um, you know, that's, that's been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. I mean, up until today, uh, we had our first company meeting ever today. Um, and if, if it wasn't for Carney coming into the mix, I'm not certain I was ever going to do this, mm. like really get to where I needed to get. I'm not certain that I was going to, I mean, maybe I would have, but it would have taken me a very long time. So it, on the Garrett Martell interview, I think I heard you mention you brought in someone to exclusively help with this. That is that Carney? Yeah. I, so Carney um, is my business partner now. She She's a partner in the company. Um, Carney came in as an intern and, and we quickly found I quickly found out she's an incredibly talented individual, uh, incredibly motivated, great learner, and she has absolute opposite skill set that i do <laughs> like if we drew up pros and cons 
they'd be completely opposite of each other. Um, but we have very aligned values. And so I think that's what, in my research on partnerships, that is the key piece there is um, aligned values and um, offsetting skill sets. So Carney it lives for system systems and lives for structure. I mean, it, it's like, that's her favorite thing in the world. It, it, like she love when you talk about this, she gets all excited. Right. And structure is not something that gets me excited. Like, you know, it's just not. Um, so I've talked a lot about wanting to do things that are now are getting done because Carney's involved. I'm fascinated with this for a lot of reasons. A, I did a very similar thing. Um, I had a friend start doing this for me last summer, started encoding things for me, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, getting it actually finished instead of a bad brain dump on a Google Drive document that I would start and never finish. Auditing the process in the field for me. Like I have someone who's going to be full-time next month uh, in the field and doing that, that was just doing that stuff for the past six months. It's so powerful. Um, but I'm also intrigued by intern to partner. Um, what what does partner mean in your business? Does that mean there's so, profit? Equity? Yes. Yeah. Carney owns ten percent of Carney is is buying ten percent of the company. Um. So and we have a partnership agreement that we are working out with a partnership attorney, mm-hmm. uh, who is very experienced in this, and so essentially the as much documentation as possible is being as much like decision making we're leaving almost nothing up to chance it's like if this then that if this then that if this then that and and just a very deep if this then that so it's there's you know because this is the time where you need i've had failed i've had a failed partnership in another company um and so i learned a lot in that experience Mm -hmm. uh And it's, yeah, things are, things are great right now. And we plan on things getting way better, but no matter what, like we need to have clear, a clear understanding. So she has, there are a number of things that where we have to agree upon for decisions. So any decision over 20, any purchase over $10,000, the company for the company, we both have to agree on it. Um, any real estate purchases, any real estate sales, um, any selling of of your shares um, has to be. We have the other person has a first right of, refu- of refusal, and then also has to um, agree to the partner that is being brought on or the shares that are being who they're being sold to. And we've just gone very far down that rabbit hole. And you know, in full transparency. Um, we are, I, we are, I'm then also financing her purchase of the 10%. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are, she's paying that off by taking a lower salary than what she's worth in the market. Um, a lot of this kind of stemmed from, you know, she was, she was getting very significant offers from corporate America, you know, whilst she's not graduated yet. She's still in college. Um, (laughs) that's, yeah, she's 20 years old. She's so cool superhuman um she's graduating a year early she's taking six classes right now she worked 57 hours at zk painting last week um what there's there's no one like i mean the, i've met a lot of people then i've never you know there's not a lot of people i want to, i would partner with especially not in a company that's got my initials on it and i've built you know with my blood sweat and tears for nine years uh-huh so yeah she's very special and i've I looked at her and I was, I've no, I've worked for her side by side for a year now. And, and I just looked like, this is somebody I want to do. I want to be in business with mm-hmm. like for the long term. And so for a number of reasons, this just made sense. Oh, I love that. What's her academic uh, background? Is it like business She's related? A, a co- marketing communications major actually. Okay. But you know how those degrees go. Sure. You know? Just because you have a degree doesn't mean you're going to do anything with it. All right. I keep telling her that she should just drop out. She has six classes to finish. This is her last semester. And I keep telling her, like, hey, the statistics say college dropouts, they're running the most successful businesses <laughs> or startups. Like, you should just drop out 
right now, right at the very end. Yeah. It's it's a running inside joke. Obviously, she's not going to do that, but she's got a lot on her plate right now. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I got to imagine when she is free of the academic responsibilities, too. That's just going to be there's a whole bunch more energy to put into, into that. That is, uh, that is a cool detail. I'm glad to know that. Um, can we go back real quick just to kind of finish that line of thought with I couldn't not go down that rabbit hole, though. Mm-hmm. The, you know, the jump from, you know, four to five, you realizing what you needed to to be providing your employees better to to now ish. Is is it still mostly learning through osmosis and just shoulder to shoulder or are there documented processes? Um, what's a win look like? Are you job costing in a regimented way? I'm just wondering, like, what's in place modern seeking? No. None of that stuff is in place right now. Um, we are, I mean, this will be our second year of like very clear QuickBooks, even understanding did the company make any money or not? Um, mm-hmm. So we start there and then it's, yeah, the job costing is, it's in the work. So we're, we're transitioning to work glue. Um, like as we speak, Monday will be the first day that the company is moved away from T-Sheets and House Call Pro and over to Workglue mm-hmm. and Slack. We've had Slack, but we're going to be Workglue and Slack right now. Um, and so job costing is going to start to happen. Um, it's, But it's not at the top of the list of things right now. We have sort of, again, triage, like what's most important. Mm-hmm. Um, we do not have – so we don't have very – I mean – if it was up to me, if Carney didn't exist, we would have nothing on paper. Um, I don't sit in front of computers and type documents naturally. Um, and so that's not a thing where I was ever going to really do that. Probably it would have been, I, I did a long time ago. I did a gloss SOP many, many years ago. And I did a gloss SOP verbally for Nick Slavic. And he mm-hmm. typed it up. And so there's one of our SOPs is, is in paper. Of course. Um, but no, I, I've relied on great humans, like great humans. We've had, like we sat today, we had a, a, our first team meeting. There was eight painters in the room and I looked around at this room and there's just like, there's eight people that when I first started in the painting business, Never mind most like if when I first started painting for myself, never mind before, but really when I never in a million years did I think this caliber of human being would would work in painting industry, never mind work for me. Mm-hmm. Um, really smart, motivated, talented people. And so because that's what I had to do to survive. Um, I like I said, I thrive on chaos. I'm very talented at a number of things and horrible at a bunch of other things. And so I've been like seriously leaning on my strengths and kind of ignoring my weaknesses. And and we've managed to do pretty well. Um, it's not scalable We've we've at all. I mean, that's not even a question. We've had a few hiccups along the way that, that wouldn't have happened if we – had better systems and better processes and better people. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I've been relying on natural talent and and that'll only get you so far. Yeah. It's, I think one of my weaknesses is that I have a hard time imagining uh, growth like that without any of this in place. And that's clearly not true because you are pumping out some of the sexiest work on earth with your, your sheer force basically. And it's, that's baffling to me. I can't envision hiring more than one person seriously without any of that in place. And that's like, that's a strength and a weakness. Um, Like when I get there, it's going to be really scalable, but it's going to take me an extra three damn years, you know? (laughs) But, but there, that's an undeniable better way to go. I, I mean, I would never recommend somebody do what I did. I, I mean, first, like, I don't, I'm, I try to be very humble. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm bad at, but I'm, I'm really good at some things. And, and so I have an extremely high risk tolerance. 
Um, I, I'm in a great market for another thing. Um, I understand how to sell and market and I understand how to paint at a very, very high level. And, and like, I, I don't know, I, I have a lot of talent and a lot of, a lot of natural talent in a lot, in a few areas. And I've, and I have great vision. I, I, I have vision for, I saw this, what, what we ZK is today. I envisioned four or five years ago, crystal clear in my eyes. Like it was so crystal clear. And everyone else told me you're insane. There's not a market for this. What are you doing? Because like anyone you work for, they weren't anyone I was working for four years ago when I made the transition. None of them were going to hire me the next day when I decided we were only using fine paints of Europe. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for my wife and like my business consultant, like nobody else thought this was a good idea. But I had like such a clear vision and you know, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just lucky at the end of the day. Like I, I put in strategic hard work. Like, don't get me wrong. Like I've devote, I I've worked. Sure. I've worked long hours. I, I don't glorify. I don't like glorifying working a lot. Like I don't, I think that's like, you know, it's kind of weird when people are like, want to glorify how many hours they worked or how many years they've been in the business. Both of those two things. I'm, I'm very sensitive to heat when people are like, Anytime you lead with how many years experience you have, I instantly discredit you <laughs> because the years you've done something are fairly irrelevant because you sure. could do the wrong thing for 20 years and suck. Yeah. And so to say you've been in the business, I have no idea how long I've been painting. And I would never say that. Like the, the years I've been painting are don't mean anything. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I, I, I had to like go down that path but I, I i lost where i was at now no I, I will pick that up i've started to respond to that question with a long answer one where it's just like technically i have been a self-employed painter since 2013 when i thought i was getting a job and was actually agreeing to be a sub illegally like the irs says 2013 when did noah realize that there was actual business part behind this that he should be paying attention to 2019 so I don't know, two to eight years, you pick, like pick your answer. Why are you asking the question? Like, what do you actually want to know? You know? Yeah. I've been doing it for a long time and I've been trying to get better at it every day. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's easier. Well, let me show you what I can do. That's like that to me, like that's way more important. Yeah. Or just, uh, yeah. I think that question misses the mark in a lot of ways. Or ask me questions. You will clearly, I will demonstrate my knowledge to you. Sure. I could gain that same knowledge in two years. You know, I, I was a better painter two years in than a bunch of painters I was working with that were 10 years in, mm -hmm. you know, it, and there's probably people who are way better than me. It, like, it, like how long you've been doing something. I've yet, I've yet to see a very successful person that I look up to lead with how many years they've been doing a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that takes us to present day. It's you, it's Carney. You know this back end stuff is important, but have very little interest in actually doing the actions yourself. You have this all star on the team. Like, what is the plan for putting this all in place? Like, would you talk about, you know, how you and Carney are conceiving of making this happen? Yeah. I mean, I think the first part, the most important part, right, is knowing what needs to happen. Mm hmm. Before you do anything again like vision is a strength of mine like seeing the end game like what's this like close my eyes what does this company look like in two years if it's crushing it like if if you can't like see that i think it's really it's even harder or, or you know so I, I would say like the first thing is we sort of i know what i want it to look like and like to be fair um 85 to 90 percent of that is just like taking pieces of other everybody else's thing that they're doing and putting it into mine like yeah. you know we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here um I, i'm maybe i'm trying to reinvent the wheel in certain aspects or, or more just like a bunch of pieces that have already existed maybe i'm putting them together in a little bit of a different formula mm -hmm. um or executing on it a little differently but for the most part i there's a bunch of companies out there 
that I just want to essentially take what they're doing and bring it into our company. And, you know, so I think the first thing we, we have is a plan of like, okay, what needs to happen? Like what needs to happen? What's that going to look like? And then it's, all right, well, what's going to, I like to look for lead dominoes. Like what is the thing? If we did this, we'll make all the other ones easier. Yeah. And you know, that's what we're going to do. And, and right now it's, you know, work glue and vans. So we, I just bought my first van. I'm actively looking for a second van as we speak. Um, probably bring the third one on in another month and we'll go from zero vans to three vans in two or three months. Um, because that's, that's been a limiting factor. I've driven 55, 60, 55,000 miles a year now for the last two years, Whoa. maybe a little less 50,000. So you are the sole logistics guy and all your employees have passenger cars driving to the site. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I have a lot of holes in my game again. Yeah. And so, yeah, like vans are going to be a huge piece because then that takes away a lot of time off of my plate um, to focus on other things um, or to go play golf. I don't know to do whatever the heck I want, but to stop having to drive, you know, three hour round trip to drop off a compressor. Yeah. Like what are we talking about? Sure. So, and, and so there's vans, there's work glue, uh, work orders. I, I've pause real quick never, on work glue. Is that, is that's time tracking? Is it task management? What else is it? It's task like? management, time tracking, um, estimates, pr proposals, invoicing, right, although we're not going to use it for that. Like we're going to send invoices. We're going to send estimates from it, but we're going to send, um, I believe we're going to use paint scout as the, like the link that we're set they, they link together. So you can send the estimate through paint scout, mm -hmm. but we're trying to use the dashboard for, for, um, work glue mm -hmm. for as much as possible. Work glue is incredibly robust and, I we real I really want to implement as much of it as possible, so that my team I I really like we want we we want all the leads starting Monday are going to be uh, every Monday morning at seven thirty we're having uh, all the leads on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Carney and I are meeting with the leads on Zoom for fifteen minutes. Um, that's I've never had a team meeting, and I've never had a formal like weekly check in for leads. Um, some of my leads might, I mean, you know, I have great people. So there was, there's four, three or four days might go by and we don't even speak, you know, because I have, I had great people. I got like, yeah, I know what he's doing. He's up there. He knows what he's doing. Like, you know, it, it was not the top of my list of things to do is to have to talk, check in with somebody because I knew they know exactly what we're doing. They know what we stand for. They know how to make the little decisions and, if there's one thing I've done right, it's it's instill a very strong company culture of craftsmanship, of quality, of client experience. So I finally wrote out my – I wrote them down the other day. And Carney, today, I, we were talking about them. And we went over with everybody. And she's like – she was like – she's like, that, those are like – how did you do that that fast? Like you just like ran, randomly just wrote five things down. And I was like, oh, well, I've been thinking, I've been thinking about them for four years. I've rewritten the list 15 times in my head. I don't write stuff down very often. And I've been living it. I've been like, we've been living these core values I through decision making, right? Mm -hmm. For years. I just never wrote them down. So just by writing them down, and now we're gonna reiterate them, it's gonna it's gonna solidify them more. But my people fit, pretty much know you know, at every turn, what decision to make, you know, when they get to a fork in the road, like what's the, what's the higher quality, better customer service answer. And, and every time I answer it the same way. So eventually they stop making phone calls because they know what the answer is. Um, I get, oh man, I'm bad. I'm not, usually I'm the interviewer with the list of things you get me going. Plus I keep seeing, is there a way to take my, I keep staring at my face. Um, I'm so used to. Um, I don't see a way to to get that out oh, of there. Well, this would this actually is going to work. 
I just minimized it. And now all I see is your face. This is right. perfect. Oh, right, man. Cool. cool. Um, dude, the tangents are where the gold is, man. I love it. Um, I do, just, again, like back to my lack of imagination for how to make this work. I am in awe of this. And if you, you know, you listen to the current zeitgeist of you can't scale a trades business. Everything's going to crash and burn unless everyone has the SOPs and then this and then that. And you're talking about just people pretty much knowing what to do in three or four days of no contact. Like there's that part of me that's, that's been brainwashed by the other thing being like, well, that shouldn't work. So like, but it, it does. And to a point, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, I'm a part of me is just in awe of this and, and just being like, I wish, I, but I think it comes at great cost. What are those? Uh, stress on my people. Mm -hmm. I've lost. So, so I've lost those, the two leads that we're talking about. They're both gone now. <laughs> um, you know, they're, Phil will probably come back, but you know, they're both leaving and not because of directly because of the stress, but you know, it, it adds a level of stress maybe that didn't need to be there. Okay. Other uh, side of the coin. Understood. I, I would say like, that's really the main one is, you know, it taxes your people and I'd rather tax my people in other ways. Right. I, 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 those are things where it's like, we want to, we want to, I told them all today, I'm trying to make your job as positive and easy as possible. And the least amount of stress as possible, because we're already on very stressful projects oftentimes uh, as far as just trying to deliver a world-class level of execution. In uh, so anything I can do to take the stress away is going to be valuable. So all the leads now are going to be writing daily logs. That's never happened. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll be daily logs. Those are, those are built into work glue. Um, so there'll be, you know, a few questions I'll answer every day. Um, boy, I, I'm, I am cool. not on my game today. Yeah, all good. All good. I, I have another question then. So right. we're talking about all the things you're doing. Mm. How much of that is you just knowing it's a good idea because you talk to other business owners versus how much of it is you hearing things from your employees that would make your life that their lives easier things that you directly hear that they want. Uh, well, there's a, a fair amount of that, I would say. Um, so there's, it's a, I think it's a combination of three things, those two things. And also just like my, I, I would say I've, I study the human, I study human, uh, fairly deeply. That's something I'm very into is like, what does it mean to be human? What is the biology of a human, you know, cause I think we're all pretty much the same. So I would say like, it's sort of a combination of like, what are other people doing? What are my people saying they need? And what does a human need in general? Um, and, you know, today I, I had Phil come in, you know, an hour early and just go like, cause he's, he's leaving at the end of next week for a while. He's taking a leave of absence mm -hmm. or however you want to call it. And I was just like, look, I need you to tell me all the things that we could be doing better to support you guys out there. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's asking like, Hey, you know, I lost Patty. Uh, she was, didn't want to be a lead painter. She didn't want the stress of being a lead painter. I put, I verbally put, I put no stress on my people. I'm the nicest boss in the world. Right. I have never said, hurry up. I have never said, what the heck? We were supposed to be done on Friday. Now you say we need to be done on Tuesday. I've never said any of those things, okay. right? I'm the nicest guy in the world. But what I recognize now is what we talked about before. Like the lack of structure is stressful in mm. a, to some people and may probably to all people. Some people thrive on it and some people crumble under it. Mm-hmm. But I think the lack of the, – the more structure you have, the more you – it's like – it's like, I don't know. The more you know where exactly where you stand and where you're going, like the, the le there's not stress there to know I'm here and I'm going there. If you, 
if you start to like dim the lights and not be able to see your footing very well and quite know where the next step is like i i'm starting to understand now based off of feedback that that is a stressful thing for people mm-hmm. to and and i i believe it and i've seen this in other examples of this being like a great example of this is is just it's maybe not great but a, a good example of the the lack of rigidity or whatever is like even just paying people cash or on the books, right? The type of person who wants to be paid, who is, is completely cool being paid cash. I would argue that they are not a good employee. Like they're not the type of people that I want on my team for mm-hmm. the long haul, right? The type of person that we did, if I were to describe the mindset of a great employee, they're going to want that structure. They're going to want to be above board and they're going to want to be paid you know, on the books. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I think that's a great analogy to many other things. Like there's the cash or on the books of all of business, you know, you know, the cash of getting a paint job done is like, do you just show up and like, all right, I'm going to tell you what to do and not do it. And on the books is like, here's a formal SOP. You can follow this from start to finish and you can be guaranteed a positive outcome. Mm-hmm. Right. And the type of people that are comfortable with one, and the comfortable with the other are different. And I think we want the ones who are comfortable with being on the books. Yeah. And so what I've had to learn the hard way is sort of through experiences because people, I'm a likable person. People like me. So they don't tell me all of these things very sure. often. Sure. Instead they boil over and then I've, I've, it's too late. And they're like, like Patty's like, I, I give up. I, I, I give up. I need to go just work someplace just painting. Now, I'm like, at, on one hand, like the the non-sophisticated, not, non-introspective, immature Zach can go, I've never told you hurry up. I've never told you this is not being done fast enough. I've never told you this isn't good enough. All I've done is say, you're awesome. You're killing it. What can I do for you? Mm-hmm. That's all I've ever done for you, Patty. Yeah. And that's super easy to just blame Patty for everything. Because, like, you can say, well, she put all the stress on herself. She was. She was stressed out of her mind and and all anxious and and coming in early and working late and thinking and blah, 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 and not getting sleep, I guess, and finding out. Like, I didn't verbally put any of that stress on her. But I made her feel crazy. I, I didn't give her st- structured support and, and, you know, I gave her verbal support, but I didn't give her a, a system to thrive in. Yeah. And I think that that's what I'm learning. And that's what I, I mean, learning. I know that now I know that that's not a sustainable way. You can burn out great people doing the, doing it the way I've done it. Um, and so now I want to keep my great people. Yeah. But we're changing. I, I think that's a, some really profound stuff you just said. And I, I think there's often going to be a pretty big chasm in between the owner and the employee minded people. You know, the, the guys that made it through the toxic, insane workplaces and went on on their own and were scrappy and never had anything good happen to them on a job site until they started their own thing. Like how, like you always make a similar analogy, like how could we possibly intuitively know how to create a positive structure environment for someone who isn't, who doesn't have that brain? Exactly. It's such a big leap that I don't, I don't think it's talked about enough. Um, but clearly there are really big ramifications of, of not having that in place or kind of ignoring it. You can't, at a certain point you can't ignore it, right? I think it's what li- it's what's holding back ninety nine percent of contractors, mm-hmm. right? All if if you say that the average contractor is one and a half guys, com- large size company, right? I c- I can think of I can think of I can think of dozens of people right now because we have ZKFS and we see people and I talk to like I can think of dozens of guys who are if you start out a painting company today, most guys, they are a painter, they're tradesmen. They want to go make more money or whatever, 
I want to do things their way. And when you talk to those people about their first hire, or first or second hire, it's a fascinating discussion, right? It's a fascinating discussion. And because they, it's like the first time you do something, you don't know, you don't know all the, like, you just have this idea, but you've never, ever done it. So, and, and you've only been an employee and there's such a difference between being an owner and employee. Like, oh my God, the second that happened to me, I looked back at my, I was a horrible employee. And I think that when you're the painter, craftsperson, starting a business and hiring a painter, you are looking at things through like such a narrow lens, a v- like incredibly unsophisticated, incredibly crude, narrow lens. Mm-hmm. What they focus on like work getting done. Sometimes not even it's not, I would say sometimes it's a focus on having a second body there. Sure. Not even the work getting done. I, I've heard people talk in ways and you're like, dude, it's not like, it's not about just having a, a body there. It's like, it's about like hopefully increased production and, sure. you know, and what does that equal? And, but, but they're just, there's, then that's why stuff like what we're doing here is valuable. And all the PCA stuff is so valuable because I think it's allowing people to s- shorten the learning curve. Mm-hmm. But I think intuitively, if you go from being a painter to being an owner and then thinking about hiring somebody, it's an incredibly crude mindset and you don't understand all these things. And it takes a very big person to when the pain points start to happen, own them, own them and and reflect on them as what did I do wrong? I read too many forums about the other guys the guy, the employees are the problem, right? The employees are not the problem. You hired them. You, your job was to, my job, I hired them. My job was to facilitate their greatness. Like that, that is what I believe my job is as an owner is to facilitate the greatness in all my people. And if people don't do a good job or or aren't producing, it's on me. Yeah. Like no one forced me to hire that person. Yeah. So, so the more I can look introspectively and go, me, me, what what can I do here? What did I do everything? What did I, like, how am I facilitating? Me, like, pointing the finger, I don't care if they really are bad. Pointing the finger is not an effective strategy mm-hmm. and is not going to teach you much. Yeah. And I've been very lucky through recovery in the program, you know, a 12-step program. It, it is about controlling what you can control and letting the rest go. And so, okay, what can I control here? Have I facilitated? Did I, did I make a garden that had all the nutrients and good sunlight and proper watering? Or did I put an awesome seed in a crappy environment, throw some water on it once or twice and go, well, the seeds are broken. Like what the heck? It didn't grow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the many things that Slavic has done very impressively is created an entire business structure, not around the painters that he wishes existed, but around the actual labor market around him. And the structure is built on the accessible person. He bought, he brought his entire business structure down to the person. It's so well designed for that. And he came from the same exact background that you mean a lot of others did just like, being the tortured craftsman yelling at people that didn't have enough training as to why they couldn't like get the result done. Like that's the new model. And I'm glad for it. Um, when you, you know, to take it back to that, to how it sounds like there have been convers- several conversations like the one with Patty, where it's like the lack of structure has been incredibly stressful for them. How, how are those conversations kind of ending? If, if you don't say the petty thing, how are you kind of resolving those? And, and So, yeah, like I, I am. Those conversations are. I'm really listening. I'm not like so I, I because of the program and because of a long a, a spiritual practice that I, I've developed over years now of, you know, trying to get outside of like the little child that's being attacked by words and and come to a more evolved self, if you will. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, when those conversations start to happen, I have a, a way I can like step outside of the attacked little child and hear it from above in a way. And so I, like, in the moment I, I'm listening and I'm like trying, to, I feel like I'm like trying to like calm my vagus nerve and like, there's just like, there's just like subconscious like thing that starts to happen where you're like, all right, I got to diffuse all this tension that I'm feeling right now so that I don't act on it. Right. Mm-hmm. And I would say like, that's the first step is like, sometimes it just takes like time. Like what I've shortened it to a fairly short time, but maybe it's 30 seconds now that I can, I just need to like sit, like and let it go away. So I don't say something out of reactive, defensive, scared child thing that isn't what I really meant. But oftentimes, like, they go really well because I, I already know I, I'm doing – I don't have a very beautiful back end of a business. Like, this is not news to me, mm. right? I know that this is the low-hanging fruit in our company is all of these things. So oftentimes, I'm just like, okay, a new data point, this is – like – this needs to be addressed. And so I'll absorb it and try to talk to them very understandingly and like, you know, focus on the big picture again. And I, I know how to, I can rally the troops and I can bring up morale and I can speak to people. Sure. Um, and oftentimes I can have them leave the conversation feeling great, but that's not enough. Yeah. The hard part is the part is the point is, that's not enough because they have to go back to that crappy environment that I built. Mm-hmm. So I can, I've been able to stem the tide in people for extended periods of time and keep them around. I had a few conversations with Patty and every time I'm like, you're, I don't know where this is coming from. You're, you're crushing it. You got it. Well, like, you know, I'm giving her this pep talk. Meanwhile, my behavior and our company didn't change. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that not taking anything personal in business is first like the, the number one rule, right? Even though it's my initials on the company, like, dude, nothing that happens when I go to work, I can take personal. And if I can actually live like that, man, it's a recipe for success. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I think that's the biggest piece is just like, Hey, I, this is my, like, I'm, I'm here. I don't have to prep for this. I can tell, I'll tell you anything. Cause it's my reality. And I've come to terms with like who I am and I'm not fighting that. And my truth, like, this is my, this is my story. You know, I did the best I could every day when I woke up, I continue to do the best I can. I'm going to do the best I can tomorrow. And hopefully it'll get a little bit better. So I don't, in the past, I felt very ashamed of a lot of this stuff. I would say that now it's like it's a it's a part of my story. Mm-hmm. And so I don't get it. I don't feel attacked when it happens, even though, you know, there's a way you could. Sure. I think For another- the record, I didn't get to say this earlier. For the record, you were talking about Nick Slavic and what he's what he's done. Mm-hmm. And I, I I'm Nick and I are friends, but let's just put it for the record. The guy what he's done is absolutely unbelievable. Yep unbelievable it it he's such an inspiration he's such a smart guy he's he's a guy who's listening to reality he's not playing in what i idealism right i i often have said idealism and business don't go together right there's no place for it being an idealist in business well put and he is a guy who's listened adapted and built a business and I have an immense amount of respect for what he's done. Yeah. There's a reason a lot of my actions are directly modeled um, after his. I'm actually going on Ask a Painter this week with him to basically describe to him how I've followed his past year's worth of Ask a Painter at encoding the back end, job costing. I Every single thing that's positive that I've done in my business in the past year has basically been based on an Ask a Painter episode. So this this week I'm going to show up and be like, look what I did, man. This is you. So you're, you're totally right. I love it. 
Um, I so many profound things coming out. I think a really cool thing that you touched on that isn't all said out loud enough as well is about the level of personal growth that needs to accompany business growth in a lot of ways. Um, it sounds like you've had a lot of realizations, worked on yourself, needed to know yourself in order to move things forward on the business front. Um, I think you can get to a certain point before you plateau with what that version of you can do without evolving a little more. And has that been, have you been cognizant of the necessity of, of, of those parallel journeys? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I like, yeah. I mean, I'm lucky that I'm an addict. Like I'm lucky that I have like an extreme, I have a disease that manifests itself very extremely. Mm-hmm. And so I had to go down a path of treatment, right? I had to change. I was on a trajectory that was not sustainable. And it was a fairly steep, unsustainable trajectory. And it became fairly clear that this was not going to work. More dangerous are the subtle trajectories of unsustainability. Because those take a lot longer to find out they didn't work. No big rock bottom or wake up call moment. Yeah. Yeah. And more like I look back after 15 years and I don't like where I am. Yeah. Ooh, that's brutal. You know, that's a brutal thing. And and because it's really easy in our world today to not be brutally honest with yourself, to never have to stop and look at yourself. Are you kidding me? There's a distraction on I mean, right here. I if I don't want to ever think about something, I don't ever need to. Right. Nope. And no one does. Good God. Yeah. You can do, you can distract yourself from reality and it, you can juxtapose that to Jason Paris, who is insanely successful, who goes on a 72 hour silent retreat annually and is incredibly introspective. Yeah. Right. It's not a coincidence that people who are introspective get where they're trying to go. Yeah. And I think, you know, being reactive to the world is not a place I want to be. And that's where I lived most of my life. And so it's like, okay, well, it's time to be proactive and like start to decide what I want to do and decide where I want to go and decide who I am, you know? And and so, yeah, I I think that a lot of people live comfortably enough that they never really end up doing that. Or I, well, I don't know. That's a ridiculous thing to say. I don't know what people do, but I think that it's harder to stop and be brutally honest and look at your weaknesses and try to work on them when you have air conditioning and cable television and an automatic vehicle and a roof over your head and the internet, like Mm -hmm. when you're comfortable, it's really hard to improve, you know, it it requires. And so I had a lot of pain that helped me to, to grow. And so, yeah, like it's definitely something I think about a lot. I think about a lot of those things too. It's, you know, you've clearly had a path where you didn't necessarily choose that level of discomfort that forced you to reckon with yourself a little more. The The other side of that is manufacturing discomfort, whether it's, you know, Spartan races or Iron Man or whatever. But I think there's there's value to all that. Um, some of it is just seen as sexier than than the other. Um, so we kind of went down a rabbit hole when we started talking about what what all of this thought all this is is leading to in terms of action and you started mentioning kind of the, the 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 list the software could we get back on the you and carney sitting down and deciding what needed to happen yeah so i think this is where i thrive again mm-hmm. with vision yeah i i love to make this plan like you t- ask me how is this going to happen Let's let's go. Let's spend four hours and let's map this whole thing out. Without an implementer that I have in Carney, it I probably wouldn't even do that because I would know it's never happening. Mm-hmm. Right. But yeah, I think it starts with making a master plan. 
of, okay, what does this thing look like when it's done? And, and then when you have that idea of like, what does it look like when it's done? Then it's like, all right, well, what are the key pieces that go into this? What are the breakdown from there? What are the things that have to be done to make those things even come to fruition? And then it starts to go, well, what's the most important thing to do? Right. What you, you can break it down as far as every single step that needs to happen in all the different areas. And, and then it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do first? And, and that's what we are working on now is we've been triaging the really bad stuff and not formally doing it under a master plan. Um, and now the next step is we're going to be sitting down in the next two weeks and de developing that master plan of let's, let's envision the company completely developed and ready to scale. What does it look like? And then, okay, well, what are the pieces that need to get done? you know, short-term, long-term, medium-term, and break it down as far as we can, as granular as we can, and then just it starts to be a list of tasks that need to be completed. Mm -hmm. um, I, that, I will live, that day I will be excited, and my brain will be firing, and we will be riffing, and, and I'll, at the end of the day, we're going to look at this board, and it's going to be unbelievable. <laughs> That's my talent. Yeah. Making that actually come to life, you know, it's a pretty picture that wasn't going to do anything without someone who's equally talented at implementing things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think for us, that's how we're going to do it. So, yeah, it is so hard to translate that vision into actionable things. I've I recently read a book called 12 Week Year, which basically... It's a different way to think about the year. You're essentially thinking in quarters and it creates, it manufactures that urgency. And it's just kind of a way to make every day feel like a week. So you, you're, you're just a little more cognizant that you can't be wasting time and you need to do some actionable thing towards that 12 week goal every single day. That's the only way I get anything like that done is manufacturing extreme accountability and, and like stress and urgency um how is there like a big framework like that that you know carney's using or you like any sort of like so i th i think you made a use this you made a statement earlier that like doing that's not very easy or fast and i think that that is true based off of the, our reality but it's actually not i don't think it's inherently true i think that there's a missing piece in this equation that has to be like, it's like the, the massive elephant in the room. It, and that is that work has to go on. Like we have to produce work. We have to create revenue. We have to get jobs done. And we need to build this thing over here. Right. If, if you were like, Hey, I have $150,000. I'm going to start a painting business. All right. Well, first thing I'd say is like, all right, we'll take the first three months and just sit in your office and do all this, right? Like, that's how businesses are started. Like, generally, people sit down and they build the business and then they open it up. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and, and so I think that that's the, really the hardest part, especially for all the solopreneurs and the guys that are one or two people, anyone, anyone working in the field. This is, I mean, this is the hardest thing. How do you work in the field? And then take that hat off and put your office hat on and and do more than just triage and do the things that absolutely have to get done so you have money in the bank tomorrow. Like, to me, that is such a difficult transition. Yeah. Um, I And I, I don't know a lot about your story, but I imagine you have a blueprint that could be followed. If I was going to design the blueprint, I would say increase demand to a point where you're charging astronomical hours, hourly rates so that you can work 20 hours a week and make what you would make in 40 hours a week, something like that. Right. And then go spend 20 hours a week building your business. I actually have an episode coming out this season. It's mostly written. I'm fine tuning it, which is a challenge to people to try to make a year's worth of money in 75% of the year's working hours by essentially doing just that. 
you got to get out of the hamster wheel. I lived in that hamster wheel for a while. I had to claw my way out of it to be able to spend a half a day on a Wednesday feeling comfortable doing office work, like working on my business, not just putting out fires. It was a multi-year process. You know, people ask me how long I've been in business. I was like, two or three years, I was learning how to do that. That is excruciatingly hard to do. And it doesn't feel important in the moment. That's the other thing. It feels boring. It feels like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm probably never going to have a 20 person company. Why am I even doing this? This like, it is so hard to make it feel worth that time. And somewhere along the lines, I just drank enough of the Kool-Aid and listened to Slavic talk enough and, you know, went to crank and just absorbed all that where I was just like, all right, this is the only path. This is the thing, even if it's not relevant for where I go, this is the thing that I'm going to decide is the key to future success and act like I'm going to need it for a 50 person company, even though I never will. Let's make this feel important like that, or else I will never spend the time doing it. Yeah, I, I think. And that you have some privilege that's allowing you to do that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you have kids, right? No kids. Yeah. It's, Are you it's married? Easier for me. Yeah. No, no. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's that's the thing is like. Yeah. Look at how hard it is for a single dude who lives alone. Mm -hmm. Like. Now you talk about a guy who's got a family to support. Yep. And he's trying to do it like like it, it's it's it is this is not an easy thing to do for craftspeople. Guys who went to business school who don't know how to paint, I mean they're the ones look around. They're the ones. They're kicking they're killing the game. They're they're eating our sh lunch. It's not even mm -hmm. funny. Mm -hmm. Because it's what they they from the start it's what they spend 40 hours a week on and it's what they love to do. Mhm. Mm I think I think the lead domino to all of this stuff, if you're to try to make the transition, is sales and marketing. Like sales and marketing, sales and marketing, sales and marketing. Raise your prices. Get your prices up. Every contractor I know, the first thing I say, it's like, dude, you gotta raise your prices. You know, there's a million excuses, a million excuses, all the head trash in the world, but. What it comes down to is when you raise your prices, you can work less and make more mm -hmm. and that will free up time. If you can, if anyone has a better answer than that, I would challenge them. I would challenge someone to give me a better solution to this problem than that right there. Because I, again, like I said, I don't love the work more hours solution. No, that seems, no. um, very unsophisticated. <laughs> it doesn't fundamentally shift anything. Um, it's like if you know you can do it three weeks a month like crazy to get that last week off a month and make a count, sure. But, but I, we just have the, the, the average price for a paint contractor in this country is it's way too low. So this is obviously supermarket and work type specific. When you're, when you're talking to all these people and saying, raise your prices, raise your prices, do you have like an hourly rate you want everyone to be able to hit and exceed? What, like, what I think, I think that are you talking about? Anything, well, first, like, like, I would say anything below $60 an hour, if you're a two-person company, is, is crazy to work for less than that. Per person. Per person. Yeah. Right? Okay. Universally, pretty much in any market. I mean, maybe there's some areas where, you know, $50 an hour is a thing. But if you're a one or two person company and you're a professional, I don't, the, I just don't see how you can't command $60, $70 an hour. If you're, if you're adding value to the market and you're good at painting, like if you can produce work at a, at a reasonable rate, probably a great rate. All these guys, anyone we're talking about works one or two people. They're, they're out producing any real company, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if you're going to produce work at a faster rate, why are you not charging more per hour than a company that's producing less in that same hour? I, so in, in this thought experiment, 
does the client know that they're paying you 67 no. bucks an hour? Okay. No. Good. Yeah. This is fixed bid and that's your take home when you do that. Fixed pricing. Yeah. But, but it, okay. So if it takes me 10 hours to do a, a room, am I charging $500 an hour? Or am I char- and there's no materials. Client pays for materials, which obviously they should never do that. But if, if you're a professional, but let's just say the client's buying materials in this insane case. And we have a 10 hour job. Do we sell the job for $500 an hour? $500? Do we sell the job for $600? Do we sell the job for $750? Yeah. Now, and anyone who tell me, oh, I can't get anyone to do that. You're full of it. You're like, it's just, you're, that's not true. You can't do it the way you're doing things today, right? I can't sell. I sold a $7,000 gloss door last week. I, the, the thought of that would have seemed, I mean, they're just like, that's so laughable to think four years ago, I would have someone paying me $7,000 to paint a front door. Mm -hmm. Right. But if I was to sit five years ago and I, and you said, all right, let's do a thought experiment. How do you get someone to pay you $7,000 to paint a front door? Right. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, now the shackles are off. What might that look like? You know? All right. Well, let's first start with, you know, the, it's going to be the, the greatest front door you've ever seen painted. Okay. Well, how do we get there? Right. Then there's going to be like, it, no one buys a $7,000 front door from a, a not a like known entity. Like you're going to have to have reputation. Right. Then like the sales process better be really awesome because they are not going to see the door until after they pay. Like, like you better have an amazing sales and marketing, right? But and if we were to like thought experiment, how do we get to this higher price? Mm-hmm. There are answers, yeah. right? We can look at these guys and, and, and anyone. You could keep all things the same and double your leads. You're going to raise your prices. You only have to get half of the jobs that you're used to getting. Your close rate can drop in half. All right. Well, I doubt that every single job you won last month, the client wouldn't have paid a dollar more. Mm-hmm. I find that very hard to believe. Most of us are leaving lots of money on the table because we didn't bring enough leads in and we have to get this job to eat today. I was there for most of my career. I would go to an estimate and I had to, I better walk out of that door with an agreement or I might not have food or rent money. Yeah. Right. But that's because I was all word of mouth, man. Let me tell you, I'm only referrals. <laughs> like, what a ridiculous thing to say. But I believed it so deeply in my heart that I believe that that was the honorable way to do business. Meanwhile, I didn't have any money and I was charging $20 an hour. Yeah. I will say I am all word of mouth. Okay, 98%. I don't put it on a pedestal, though. I know there's a point where I'm going to have to change. Um, but when I talk to guys like you that preach certain things, you're one of your big things is social media, Instagram. This week I did my first lead that I got through Instagram organically just by posting what I'm doing. I didn't put any energy into that until eh, two, three months ago. And a realtor, uh, I guess was watching me do that, that really sexy front porch and door restoration that I did last fall. And she was like, I want my door to look like that. I was like, great. ZK moment. Boom. Now you're going to double down on social media because of this positive experience and you're going to find more of it yeah. and you're going to do more and you're going to be like, and whatever you charge for that setup, that setup today, you will be able to charge 30% more next year mm-hmm. at all things equal. Cause the demand side, if you continue to increase the, this is, I tell you this is all the time is, is simple economic if anyone if you're running a business and you haven't taken microeconomics that's gonna hurt you because there's some basic fundamentals to economics and one of them is there's a supply and demand curve and that if supply stays exactly the same and demand goes up the price goes up right if i have 10 times as many people who want to buy my one can of seltzer i guarantee you i can sell it for more than if i have one person who wants to buy it Mm-hmm. And this is the problem that I talk, I hear from, I said it forever. So I, I know I'm very sensitive to it, but I hear from lots of contractors. Well, I'm busy. If I hear anyone say I'm busy, 
like, dude, that's like saying I've been in the business for 25 years. <laughs> what does that mean, bro? Yeah. I talked to, I swear to you, it's been long enough now. And I'm sure he, I hope he's not watching. I talked to a guy the other day, months ago now, who told me those exact things. I told him, what do you, I didn't, you don't even have an Instagram. What? Oh, I'm busy. And I, I peeled that onion back two things. He was charging $25 an hour mm. in California. Oh, no. Okay. So like this idea, well, being busy, I could book the next five years of my company tomorrow if I reduce my cost by prices by 75%. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. you, you can win every job if you look, mo well, most jobs can be won. Many jobs, I should say, can be won by being a lower price. My clients, good luck. You come in to one of my clients and with a lower price, that's not going to win you the job. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's plenty of people who it would. And and so I think sales and marketing, if if I'm a contractor in the field every single day, I mean, and I, and I come at it from a different angle, but I still, the first, the first system I put into place, the first thing I prioritize is sales and marketing. Because that's the lead domino that's going to free up my time to go build all the other systems. Mm -hmm. And I think it just goes, it just, it's an overlooked phenomenon. And like, yeah, and easy to overlook if you're busy, in quotes, and not peeling that onion back and saying, why am I busy? Could I be more intentionally booked than just busy or overwhelmed? Um, I like, you know, it's a common quote, but I've found it true in my life that being overwhelmed and too busy is a form of laziness because it just means you're kind of taking what comes to you without much of a filter. Reactive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so another interesting thing to, I don't know how to get into this one, but I'm just going to talk it out and see what happens. I totally agree that. First step, raising your prices, freeing up more of your time. You are obviously a big proponent of fine paints and people mm -hmm. learning to differentiate themselves in the market, decommoditize their services, theoretically then commanding a higher price point. I see that all tracking. I think one thing I would worry about in that scenario is something that I kind of harp on, which is that whole craftsmanship trap thing, which is when you know you start playing with Holland Lack or Ecosat and then all of a sudden you need thousands of dollars worth of, you know, prep stuff and you're going to be applying that stuff differently. And you, if you want it to look, look like glass, that just doesn't happen overnight. That stuff isn't scuffing. You got to go down a rabbit hole for that. You got to spend money when in that phase, I'm also not convinced that that is the best choice when you could be working on the back end of the business. To me, that feels like a double edged sword. You see what I'm saying? I 100% agree. Yeah. 100% agree. I, and so I, I, I got down, I got, I went down the fine paints rabbit hole purely out of ego, purely to feed my ego mm. uh, when I started. Right. And then I realized I was lucky enough to be in a market where I could build a business around that type of work. Yeah. Right. I sell Ferraris for the price that Ferraris cost to people who want Ferraris. Right. I'm not selling Ferraris for Mercedes prices to people who want Mercedes or even to like to people like, yeah, most guys, the lead domino is not going to be taking your, your painting skills and upping them. If you want to make more money, right? People come to ZKFS all the time to, to learn FPE and what we do. And all the time, every time I tell them, if you're going to do one, I would do the social media class. Mm -hmm. If you want to make more money right away, do the social media class, mm -hmm. right? Invest in your sales and marketing. If that's, if making more money is what, what you want. Yeah. The lead domino generally won't be it, it for a skilled painter. Won't be going to that next 10% because most of those, I would say it's fair to say almost all of those guys we're talking about, their customer service experience isn't anywhere near even above average. Right. So to go take a, a paint job to go world class with the subpar customer service experience, right. that's a recipe for even less money. 
that's a recipe yeah. to make less money than you make now. Um, so I, I agree. I think you're right. Like it's, it's adding more value to your client. And Nick posted a couple things on the, in the business brush group recently about that. And that's why I commented that Ferrari quote I just said. And I think that, that generally as craftsmen, I know I can say for myself, I am much more comfortable talking about how to get a better 5% better paint job than I am talking about how to get a 5% better customer service experience. Yeah. You know, that's not why I got into this. Mm -hmm. It's only through, you know, lots of experience and studying the human condition that I recognize how important the customer service experience is. So there's a thing we talk about at ZKFS. The thing I talk about a lot, I, I'm going to say I coined the term. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it, it's probably not, but whatever. I, I call it the sommelier effect, mm. right? And there's a phenomenon where there's a reason why sommeliers have a job. And a sommelier is a guy who will show up at a fancy restaurant and tell you a very amazing, sexy story about a bottle of wine and its origins and the notes and the blah, 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 blah. And he's going to be dressed impeccably. His tie is going to be square. He's going to have a nice haircut. He's going to speak well. He's going to hold the bottle in a very specific way. He's going to pour in a very specific way. And when he does all those things, that bottle of wine is going to, by all objective reality, taste better than if I gave you that bottle of wine in, in a Dixie cup and I had you sip that bottle of wine. Yes. Right? Literally, the wine tastes way better objectively if i think if you looked at the brain scan the brain scan of the person who drank one versus the other and it's exactly the same bottle of wine would be night and day right so that sommelier effect is is just as real in the painting business so yes. the paint job stays exactly the same one of them is you come in with a guy who's dressed to the nines his bow tie straight he doesn't like the sommelier right you come in with a team of people who are dressed impeccably we just decided on a new company uniform in our company today and it was very exciting and we are going to look unbelievable right cool. everyone's going to be completely perfect and we're going to speak to you with respect and understanding and we're going to mask off everything with extreme respect and understanding and give you this beautiful it's going to be a show we're putting on a show so one of our core values is perception is reality and, Ooh, and I love that. Like that is this. That is how like how I'm perceived is how we'll be real. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if this customer service experience is amazing, and they've every time they picked up the phone and called me, I answered. And when they emailed, I emailed right back. And I was responsive. And then my guys show up and they are beautiful. And there's everything is organized and the tape lines are laser straight. And like all of those things happen. Right now, the paint job, exactly the same paint job perceived two completely different ways versus my guys show up wearing basketball shorts covered in paint with, you know, wife beaters on mm -hmm. and they they're smoking cigarettes out right outside on the porch and throwing their butts on the floor. And like, whatever, there's an extreme example, but the paint job, exactly the same paint job perceived two completely different ways. So. Yes. Could we go spend a little bit more time making our, our bottle of wine taste better in a blind taste test? Yeah, we could. But I would say it's way easier to just put on a nice shirt, straighten our little bow tie, and hold a bottle of wine different. That's an easier way to get a better tasting bottle of wine. And so I think, yes, the answer is get a better customer service experience, do some marketing, build demand, keep the paint jobs exactly the same. Mm -hmm. your price will go up and that will then fuel you to be able to do all the things to go to the next level. But if you were talking about lead dominoes, yes, it's increased demand, give better service. Mm -hmm. This makes me curious if, if you have ways of distinguishing and communicating to your team, different levels of a ZK finish, like some, like, Gloss black ceilings, maybe you can't compromise on. Maybe that like that just has to be an A plus, right? Are there other things where you're like, 
like an 80% is still 20% above what the customer will notice and more no. realistic for us to produce? No? Generally, no. I, I will say generally, it's not been my experience. Um, I don't have any plans on doing like A plus B, A, B, and C level jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, generally, I would say um, the only way we would ever do that, the way we do that, differentiate is through like process through like, okay, this job is going to be scuff the trim and put one coat of top coat on. We're doing that in two bedrooms right now. Paints in fine shape. It's the bedrooms. The client was like, I don't really care. I just want a fresh coat of paint. Okay. We'll scuff. So the spec is scuff the trim, put one coat on it, put two coats on the walls, two coats on the ceiling, you know, we're in and out. So in a way that is dialing back our process, right? Downstairs in the same house, we did extensive sanding, full coat of primer, extensive sanding and filling, two top coats. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, there is a 30% difference visually, probably, in those two rooms. And so I'm able to do that in a way where it's like the, the spec is fundamentally different. We're not using different products but we are taking our prep to a different level, right? Cause that's where all the money is at is in the prep. But what I will say is I'm not in my experience. I have no interest in actually dialing back. So the, in the customer service experience, exactly the same. We protected the surfaces the same way. The same people behave the same way in the same house, mm-hmm. right? Those things are all never going to be compromised. And, and so I would say like, to me that, to me that, that is answering your question with no, we don't have an A and a B. Mm-hmm. We have a and we have an a ZK finish, and that is designed by me through the sales process. So I listen to a client. I've gotten so much better, like exponentially better at listening to clients. Like first of all, listening in general, but <laughs> listening to clients, um, really asking the questions, like smart thoughtful questions on a proposal on an estimate and a walkthrough mm-hmm. right for years and years i would walk into a house i would look around i'd ask them oh you know roughly a couple things and then you walk around the house you take notes and you make a bid mm-hmm. that's what everybody every painter does every painter does that mm-hmm. and so you're not different again but we recently won a very large project and and I, I we walked out of the job. The designer called me. He was like, your, that, "Your client loves you." But I went in there like like the most curious version of myself I could possibly be, mm-hmm. and I like really want to understand, like, how do you like your, I don't know your your pasta and meat sauce. Like, what do you care about? Like, do you care about? Do you like your pasta al dente or not or? I, I do like a sweet saucer. Like I'm trying to like every little, so I can reverse engineer a recipe yeah. to give you the exact meal that you want. Yes. Right. Oh. Yeah. I think that's so critical. I can see how it's not an A and B and a C, but the salient point there is that you aren't overdoing those upstairs two bedrooms worth of trim for your own ego. You're giving them what they want. You like that is a huge thing. You've cre- you've understood the expectations and then delivering perfectly on all of them because you can do whatever you want. You could have made those a mirror. They don't care. They don't want a mirror. Super important point. Just because you can make a mirror every time doesn't mean yeah. That's that's not what it like. Hey, I I can't. This is not an ego thing anymore. Yeah. I I my ego is is minuscule compared to what it was five, six years ago. And I, I work every day to keep it very small and stay right sized mm-hmm. to be humble. And, and, you know, to be humble just means to know where you stand. It doesn't mean to say I suck at everything. Sure. It's, this is reality. And yeah, like what is my job here? My job is to provide a, a business to build a business where I can have my, my passion. My goals are to build a business where I can have employees who are team members 
who have careers, yeah. who have health insurance and 401k matches, and they're, they have a bonus incentive program that's directly tied to the profitability of the company. Mm-hmm. And, and they have, they are, they come to work, which is they spend how many hours a week being a ZK painting employee. Like they come to a place that when they leave it, they're better people. They go home and they're positive, happy people to be around because they have a great place to come to work. Right. That's what I want to do. And so, you know, that's not about me anymore. Like ask me 10 years ago what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted, I wanted all the shine and I wanted a million dollars. Right. But I I don't know. So I want to take it back to the recipe that you and Carney have created. You have the vision. There's going to be some lag time before a lot of that stuff is actually implemented in place. Right. What do you think the first thing is that's really critical to start creating now? You know, there's clearly like the employees could use some structure. There's some stress points there. What do you feel like is most critical and most, most realistic to bring into reality soonest? 100% it's communication. It's systematized communication. Mm. I, I believe that what that is, that is, I mean, I know that's our lead domino. That's what I've decided with Carney. That is our lead domino. It's like, okay, once we get clear, systematized communication, so that for that, for us, that looks like every Monday, it's leads at 7.30 are getting on Zoom. Carney, myself, and our leads are all going to be on Zoom every Monday. The first Monday of every month, the entire team is going to be on. So that's that's at 7.30. That's going to be a short meeting, but it's, hey, everyone's checking in. Everyone knows where we're going this week. All right, go to town. And then each day, the lead is going to write a job log. And then every first of the month, we're going to have a 30-minute Zoom meeting with the team at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. Hey, everybody's here. Here's what's going on. Any quick updates? Anybody have anything they want to say? All right. Make a couple jokes. Team meeting over. But structuring that, structuring the communication. So next Tuesday, Carney is going to be scheduling everybody's um, evaluations and, and quarterly evaluations mm-hmm. and, and systematizing that structure, putting it into a structure where, okay, here it is. And you know, when we finish one, we're going to book next one and we're going to like, it's going to be just systematized. And then, okay. You know, everyone's going to, this is how we're going to communicate. Like I will not respond to text messages and you should not either. If I text you, do not respond. Everyone has Slack and everyone has notifications turned on. And so for me, communication was the piece that if we start there, it will, it will be the catalyst to every other thing we implement, Mm -hmm. implementing quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. Is there a plan to grow this year or is this a maintenance year while the back end catches up? We probably won't grow for two years. That my, the plan is that there won't be growth for two years. So we need this year to get our numbers and get our stuff to together. Mm-hmm. Then we need next year to be our first year with the employee compensation bonus program mm-hmm. where we're going to, we're going to show total revenue. We're going to show net profit and we're going to say anything above this net profit, we split 50, 50. Mm-hmm. And then everyone becomes having, everyone begins to have a, an ownership mentality mm-hmm. and it's not fair to them to grow Especially, I don't want to do that. I don't. It's not helpful if I don't give out any bonuses. Right? <laughs> Having a bonus program where you don't give out any bonuses is pretty pointless. Yeah. So, you know, I want to. I've done this insane like sprint up the mountain from base camp to base camp to base camp, like barely refueling enough to get to the next next base camp. Now it's like we have gotten to a summit, and we are going to hang out here for a while. Like we're going to plant apple trees and start getting apples. <laughs> like, like we're going to be here until we are living in a new city. And then we're going to go to the next frontier. Yeah. I, I have, I have done this in a crazy way. I feel very lucky. It's like I rolled dice and got lucky like 10 rolls in a row. And it's like, it's time to stop. 
Mm-hmm. And now it's like, all right, I got lucky. I got I got gifted the ability to be at this spot. Now I need to like put down roots, build, you know, and and really, really make this like and whether that's whatever that looks like, it you know, I would imagine what that ends up looking like is again, I spend even less time working in the business because I have ZKFS. I, I want to start, you know, in a perfect world, I'll start a social media marketing company in, in two years. I'll have like more real estate and, you know, hopefully like, hopefully I can build something that doesn't require a massive amount of my time mm-hmm. and I can go do other things. And, you know, I, I think that's the beauty of, of building a business is, I mean, look, Jason Paris is a stakeholder, shareholder. <laughs> Yeah. Like that's, that is insanely impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, I don't think there's anything stopping anyone from doing that if that's what they want to do, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know that that's what I want to do. I oftentimes don't set my goals high enough because I'm too afraid of what it lo- might look like. Like I, I didn't, I didn't want to, a company, a, a very large company for a long time. I didn't want a bunch of employees. Like I, I wanted a really high hourly rate and a really long lead time. Yeah. Because that's safe. Yep. Right. And at the end of the day, that's because I didn't want to think about having to implement systems and processes and like do things that don't get me going. Yeah. Not because it's not what I actually want. Like, I, like again, we talked about like understanding what you actually want is so important, and it's not easy. It's not that's not taught to us in school. Nope. Like here's how you figure out what you really want in life, ch- kids. Yeah. No. And so you know, I think it's it's a constantly evolving thing. But I I don't see we we will not be growing. We're we we're gonna we may grow a subcontractor pool. Not even a pool. We we have one subcontractor really that we're going to work with, but uh, we may grow that. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure we're going to grow. Mm-hmm. We're going to grow revenue wise through subcontracting to a premier organization that I don't have to worry about. Um, but I'm not. I don't want to grow past ten employees. You know, I think it's safe to say for two years. Mm-hmm. That level. It's also insane there. to say. I I don't know. A year from now, that might completely change. Sure. Well, I was just about to say that level of clarity has to feel good in some sense that the next year to two, you kind of know the mission. It's clear, you know? I think that's rare in, in business, that level of just dedication to that one thing. If you want success, I think it's the most important thing. Gary Vee always says it. Mac, if you take care of the macro, the micro takes care of itself. Like once you figure out your macro plan, the micro is easy. Right. Once we lay out this 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 tree of del- of things that need to get done, that's that's honestly that's the hard part. Mm-hmm. In some ways, it's well. Let's just say it's really hard to do the micro yeah. without the macro plan. Right. Yep. Really hard to, to get the energy to want to do it, to have it feed into the next thing that you do. Right. And not have them completely contradict. Or like, if you want any momentum. You have to know which way are, are we pushing. Mm-hmm. If we push back and forth, back and forth, like it, we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that I am a very big advocate of of taking a step back and figuring out the macro before you start working really hard. We've talked about how hard it is to make it feel important, how hard it is to actually implement. Do you believe that even if it may not, even if it's kind of idealistic, that Every solo person thinking about hiring their first person should have most of the stuff we're talking about in place. No, I don't think so. No. I think that a lot of the stuff we're talking about, you don't need for a two person company. You don't need what systematized if- communication. You see each other every day. Like, what do I need a, a systematized way to check in with someone if I look at them every single day for 40 hours a week? To get in that pattern and the habit. Well, but you don't need it for two is what I'm saying. No, of course. Of course. If we were to triage these things, Mm -hmm. I would say, no, like you don't need 
you don't need all of the things. You need a few of the things. And then you can, you know, then you can increase revenue. And you can carry a little bit more overhead. And if you continue to raise prices, now you can afford to go to the next. I, I do think it's sort of plateau, plateau, plateau. That's more reasonable than saying, I'm going to be a, a solopreneur. I'm going to build all these systems. I'm going to do all this stuff, right? Like, it's like in video games. Like, you know, I, I like I like sort of the like strategy RPG sort of we got to – how do we maximize our inputs to like to get to like, you know, like civilization or, or some, a game like civilization is a perfect example. Like, if you just do one thing too much and don't like – Go, duh, 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 duh. It, you're not going to grow nearly as big and as fast as you ever possibly could. Like, mm -hmm. I think it is much more like this, 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 than like this, than this, than this. Like, again, I, I, I think, but everyone's different. Everyone has a different capacity for chaos, a different capacity for. But I think it is. It's that's the art of running a business. That's the that's the skill that comes in running a business, right? I make thousands of decisions a week right that's the like the talent and the skill about business comes from okay well how are you dealing with all the inputs and what decisions are you making and what are you prioritizing and but the question is like has anyone have you ever stopped to think about this stuff like have you gone well what would it look like if i didn't hire somebody what would it look like if i did let me think these things out what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What are my things? Like, I, I think that everyone could probably, most people could probably do with a lot more of that type of thinking mm -hmm. and, and going like, what is motivating those decisions? Yeah. Like, what are my motivators here? Do I have this like pain in my side? Do I have like a nail in my hip that I need to get out in order to keep going? Or like, or is it, or is it like, is it like making me tilt and is everything being seen like through a tilted lens because I have this one extreme pain point that I, you know, or trauma that's like just it's impacting everything and how I see the world. Yeah. You know, I think the more we can be incredibly honest with ourselves, introspective and, and think, you know, those things pay off. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, you, you're at a place where you grew a, a decent sized paint business. Pause, you're building up the back end to catch up. You have Carney. If you could talk to other people in similar shoes that might not have that partner who's a killer at that, who's experiencing the same pain points though, what what would you communicate to them about what to do first and prioritize without that extra resource that you've you've just taken on board? I I mean I so there's there's like two two forks here. There's two like there I think there's two main things we have to decide first. One is that person gonna actually be the one who does this stuff, or are you gonna hire cases, someone to do it? Yeah, good point. Um, I would I would say generally I think people would be better off, and then this is probably very controversial, but I would say people would be better off hiring that person. Now. Okay, could because at, at a growing business, everyone has a decision of what is the first piece of overhead employee I'm going to hire, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone like individually can decide. And, and I don't think it's a universal like, well, the first employee should always be a bookkeeper. Like, yeah. well, no. What if I love accounting and QuickBooks and I want to do it all myself, right? So I would say, okay, well, there's a thought experiment that says I build up a insane demand. I get my hourly charge rate up pretty high and I can afford an implementer to come in and do all these things for me. Right. That is one way to go about it. If, if you have my skill set, that's the way to go. Right. Yeah. I, I thrive on selling that door for more and more and more and more and more money. And what are all the things to do that makes a client just as happy at the end of a $7,000 door as the other client was at a $4,000 door, right? Because if you don't have happy clients, it's irrelevant. So how do I, how do I increase demand side? 
how do I de- over de- how do I deliver to make meet that or or maybe you're a, a type of guy that absolutely loves efficiencies a Slavic right how do I get my costs down and keep my charge rate the same that's gonna or my 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 what I charge the same my rate will go up because my cost went down right mm-hmm. or my efficiencies so maybe you're a guy who loves efficiencies okay well then figure out a way to get super efficient at painting while keeping your prices the same. I, I'm a big believer in following your biology and, and not trying to fight it, right? What are you really good at? What gets you going? We'll triple down on that. Mm. And yeah, the other things are going to suck. All right, we'll hire those things out, right? I didn't come up with that. Gary V, that was his answer at Crank. If yes, you I watched that. That was yeah. my question. I, it, my, it was my question because I wanted him to say what I already believed. <laughs> but, and I, I had a feeling that he would. I get it. But that like I think that's the way to go is like you really can't look at somebody else and go, well, what did they do? Mm-hmm. Right? You can't look at me and go, well, what did Zach do? Well, you don't have the same market, you don't have the same brain. Like you're di- you're a fun just you're fundamentally a different human being than me with a different set of realities. So it's I don't think it's incredibly valuable to look at someone and go, like, I'm gonna copy exactly what they did. Mm-hmm. unless you determine that they are a very similar type of person with a very similar wiring, very similar circumstance, like, okay, well then now that's the type of person that I might want to emulate. But I think it's dangerous if you just go, well, well, Nick Slavic did this. So I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. But if like, for me, if I would have followed the Nick Slavic model, I probably wouldn't be in the painting business. To be honest, I, I wouldn't be a painter right now. I would have been so miserable figuring out how to paint a room in a half an hour less time <laughs> or like figuring out and making pictograms of all the supplies and the tools that are going to come to a job for people. And like none of like, that doesn't get me out of bed. Yeah. Like just does it just doesn't. And, and so I could go, well, I'm going to force myself to do those things. And, and I, let's, okay. If it was between eating and not eating, or paying my rent, not paying my rent, I, I probably would have figured out a way to do it. Yeah. But I would have been incredibly ineffective at it. I would have slogged through it. I wouldn't have been a happy person. Let's say I would say I am effective at it. I'm a smart guy. I can learn things. Mm-hmm. What if I'm not satisfied or fulfilled by any of that? I, I would I would say, okay, if you have like massive gaps in your game, fill them yourself. But I think that, again, we can look at a way where a a world where like the first part time employee you bring on is an implementer who does these things. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, well, how do we bring on somebody that doesn't make any revenue for the company? Well, we need to generate more profit in the company to cover for their to cover their salary. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, how do we generate more profit? We either increase our prices or we reduce our costs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you go, well, what am I going to be best at? What are my biggest, lo- what's my lowest hanging fruit? Right. I, you know, cause I like, what do I know? I'm, I'm, I am no like business genius. Like I'll be honest, like I'm not, but I think I've used the situation that I had and the cards I was dealt to the best of my ability. And that's what all of us should be trying to do generally is like, Hey, what do you got? What's your reality? What's the best thing we can do here? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the story of our industry right now. All of us are square pegs and round, round holes. We, we, will, we want to be craftsmen, not business owners. Most of us. Most of us are oh, forcing yeah. the business end. I'm forcing it. I would much rather be stripping 200 years worth of lead paint off of beautiful columns. I would you just rather come work for me. <laughs> if we were in the same market, I would. I'm not even kidding you. Like, I, yeah, I would. But, that's, but yeah. that's the point. You know, I, there's a couple guys in my life I've said the same exact thing to. I'm like, dude, what, what are you doing? Yeah. Why? Right? Why? And and that is that is the that slow trajectory that we don't find out we're on the wrong one for such a long time mm-hmm. that you see sometimes in people where you're like, well, do you look back and feel like, you know, I, I, I didn't stop to, to figure out what I really wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But hopefully some of these people are listening to this and and they might stop for a minute. Yeah. And you know, Gary V, I love what he says. He's like, there's a bunch of people who are awesome number twos who shouldn't go start their own company. 
Mm-hmm. And there's a bunch of no- guys, number ones, guys who start companies who need those number twos. Yeah. Right. And together, right. That it's, and that's why I loved what he said. I asked this question too. And no, no, I didn't ask this. They, it was hours. It was like, not even, it was a half an hour after Carney and I just had our big talk where I, she was like, I'm going to corporate America. And I was like, why don't you come on as a partner? And not, a, not an hour later, Gary V and like riffing goes, you should watch what happens when you take your number two and you give them a percentage of the company. That yes, I had, I did the same exact thing with my person. Same exact thing. We were having discussions on whether she could really leave her job and come work for me full time. Like we had been entertaining it for a while and it felt like it was just coming to a head like around that week. And she was over watching some of those bigger crank nights. And that that was poignant on my end, too. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. And, and I, I was like, I, if you watch, no one's going to do this, but if they go back and watch my talk. I literally, I go, I almost spilled the beat because I hadn't told anyone. Carney and I just had the conference for the first time where I was offering her a percent of the company. I'd only told my wife. And and I was like, yeah, I just had like that. And I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> I can't like, I don't want to say this yet. But I was like, yes, like, this is what I want. Like, why not be a number two someplace, get a percentage, be, have an ownership mentality, but like get to do what you love. Like yeah. Phil was a perfect example. He's like, hey. I want nothing to do with owning a company. Yeah. I want to dedicate my all hundred percent of my time and my skill and capacity to ex- like perfecting the painting process. Mm-hmm. And look what he was able to do. He came into my company and two years later, if we look at the skill set Phil had two years ago to where it is today, and it's because I empowered him to chase the passion. Mm-hmm. I'm not like I, I'm not taking credit for for this like but i i created the environment that allowed phil to go to another level and push the craft mm-hmm. right had he been trying to manage a business throughout that entire time like no way what are we talking about no it's no. not even possible nope so i i feel like i could talk to you about this stuff forever and just free associate it's been almost two hours i want to, I want to respect your time here on um, on that kind of fundamental topic of implementing and coding, looking ahead, is there anything else you want to communicate? Resources, big thoughts, anything there that we, we kind of left on the table or plays around? Well, I mean, I, 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 I'd be insane not to tell you how amazing ZKFS is. <laughs> that was another question after that. Right? Any plugs you want to do? But, yeah. No, but yeah, I mean, I, I think... Anyone listening to this who's not tripled down on marketing, it, like you're you're missing out huge, right? And you, you know you should come to ZKFS Social Media Marketing class, uh, or or take other marketing courses, social media marketing courses. I happen to have an, a proven blueprint that works. Like it just it's that simple. Um, we'll do a million a million plus in revenue next year from Instagram. Wow. Like that's nutty. Wow. Like to, to, to think of that concept, like, I mean, it's just like, it's mind blowing. Uh, it'll, this is it'll, all organic, not paid. All organic. Wow. Yeah. I, I maybe I, I might've paid like 20 bucks for an, an ad like years ago for fun. Like, but no, none of it's been paid. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I have a very proven, so I've tried a lot of things. Like this is not like, I, like, like anyone with that's found success doing anything. It's not cause I got lucky like that, like worked really hard. Right. Four years ago, I had no work, lots of time on my hands. I did lots of R and D and hard work and studying Instagram specifically. Mm-hmm. So it through a long, a lot of trial and error, similar to what I did with fine paints of Europe. I've, I've accomplished a certain level of mastery and, and, and understanding that I've now built a school where I can, it's a school I would have killed to go to and would have saved me a ton of time and money. Yeah. Right. And, and so now we have the ability to teach and like that, that gets me going because I'm, I'm shortcutting a bunch of people's learning curve Mm -hmm. and that makes me feel good. Right. 
So in order to do those classes and teach that stuff, did you have to go through the systematization of that stuff? And if so, was it different to build it with the teaching end result in mind? Yes. So this is a great point. This is a great point. We, we said this before. I got to get a seltzer and then sure. we're going to hit this sure, point. Sure. <laughs> so this, this actually came up today. So I have the beauty, we, because of ZKFS starting from scratch, it started, I don't know, it started probably f- six months ago during COVID, maybe a little longer. I, I randomly looked at Carney and I went, I'm going to start school and I'm going to make a post on Instagram on a story and I'm going to announce it. And 10 minutes later I did. And we sold out two classes in, you know, in no time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then it was like, Oh, well, now I got to figure this out. That, now I need to do something. Right. So luckily I had a couple times to, to iterate. Um, but that was really easy for me. To, to systematize mm-hmm. because we started from scratch. I had Carney the whole way. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and I had to like write an itinerary, and like plan out a day. There was going to be a bunch of people here, like, and they were paying good money. Like, and the only way this thing was going to sustain is if they went home and told their friends that they got a lot out of it. Mm-hmm. Like I had to, it had to work. Yep. So, I was blessed with all of the knowledge already, all of everything sitting there at my fingertips. Yeah. Carney looking at me and be- and being there from the start and a blank slate. And like it, in the opposite of kind of what we were talking about before, like and and no work to have to go do tomorrow. Like we had some time to plan this. Mm-hmm. Right. And I've gone to courses. I've gone to two day classes on trades based things, metal classes. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been a student. So I've been there and I knew exactly what I didn't want it to be like. Mm -hmm. I'd been to classes and I'd been like, this is super exciting. Oh my God. This is unbelievable. I can do anything. This is crazy. Oh my God. Let me get creative. And then I came home the next week and I like, you know, I did nothing with it ever after. Right. But I was all jazzed up and I was like, well, that's not very effective. So I want So I knew I had a lot of knowledge. It was already there. I just had to put it on a paper and I had Carney right there looking at me. And it's again, it's like it's the opposite of what we do. It's a controlled environment. It's a factory setting. Right. Sure. Everything's exactly the same. All the inputs, all the outputs, everything's controlled. That's what I think makes what we do so hard is every single job I go to is completely different. Yeah. How do you write an SOP? I mean, it's not, I'm not saying you can't, but how, like writing an SOP for the kind of work I do, where every job is so custom and is so unique, it's far more complex than writing mm-hmm. an SOP for a school, Yeah. right? A two-day class. Like, yeah. I was able to just go, all right, let's make an itinerary. It started there. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, you know, and then we iterated. We did a couple classes. We saw what worked. We saw what didn't work. We we got feedback. So we we literally gave everybody um, survey monkey surveys, and we listened to the feedback and we adapted. And you know, within six classes, we have this like Swiss watch. Yeah. But that's not that's not a very good analogy to a painting business, because. Yeah. Like, okay, big picture it is. Very generally, it's a good analogy. But it's far more complex to do it for a painting business. It is. And I asked because I had a suspicion that would be your answer because I have made a mountain out of doing it for my painting business. And I have podcast SOPs set up, editing, because I'm handing a lot of this stuff off soon. I made this in an hour. It was easy and it was fun. And it barely needs tweaking. Because it was a little side project. And it 
it isn't the mountain that is my business that has that should include every single variable we could consider while bringing our complicated services to a home. It's also it's also like a factory. It's the same every time. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like the difference between writing an SOP to make a a McDonald's hamburger and get to the moon. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're night and day. Yeah. Right. But they, the, the beautiful point that many people have shown is they can be done. Yeah. If you could make an SOP to get to the moon, like, what are we talking about? I don't care how <laughs> complex the paint job is. One can be written. Yeah. And so, yeah, like, I, I think ZKFS has been an amazing experience and has become a profitable entity right away mm-hmm. because I think the nature of the model is much easier being that it's the same thing every single time. And once a month for two days, we do, we rinse and repeat. Mm-hmm. And I've, you know, but it, it is a good analogy to what needs to happen in other businesses. Well, it's, so, I, I think it's just an interesting little, like little human condition thing that we've both kind of acknowledged that we are not temperamentally excited about encoding the stuff in the back end of our business, but you give us an easier side project and it's done relatively fast so it's contextual which is a great point like that's how you get all of this stuff done yeah is you make small easy tasks like when we make our full tree for our master plan Mm -hmm. it's going to be a bunch of small easy tasks some of them will be harder but but they they will be small digestible things where carney loves she's carney's favorite thing is to put a line across something off of a to-do list yeah it do- doesn't do much for me it gets her going yeah it's like okay well know that and then i would say it's probably true for most people know that put a bunch of small things down and you're like oh yeah that was easy like you think about this big huge thing you have to do over there you know and it's that thing about how do you eat an elephant you know yeah and i think it is true but Sometimes when you're so into it, it's hard to see and, and then hard to, I know for me, a lot of it has been mental, mental, emotional, mo- very emotional blocks mm-hmm. of like, it's to this day, like we had this meeting today. I like, I've not been that nervous. Well, I've not been that irrationally nervous in a long time. Last night I, I was irrationally nervous mm-hmm. because a side note, uh, or, or a nice, a fun piece of information. I have planned this meeting at least a handful, at least five times. This meeting has been on the books and then never actually happened. At wow. least five. And, and so, like, you know, you start to build things up in your head as much bigger than they really are. And that, that's the human condition. And I understand it, but it didn't make it any less real what I was feeling last night. Mm-hmm. And so, like, again, like, that's kind of why I think, like, okay, maybe I can't, maybe it's not as easy to overcome. If you've built up some huge ones in your head, I think you can go to therapy. I'm a big advocate of therapy. I think you can go to therapy and you can probably work them out over a long period of time. Um, I think you could, like, read some books, maybe make a small dent. But let's be real, like books aren't going to overcome emotional blocks very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, You could try to say I'm going to grit it out and force myself. But, you know, that's where I go. All right, well, Mick, that's when I want to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I have a massive emotional block over here. There are a number of ways I could get around that block. And for me, the easiest one is double down what I'm good at, make some more money and pay someone to fix. And so... I tend to lean toward that's the easiest way. Yeah. It sounds like you learned very well to go with your strengths and not swim upstream and beat your head against the wall. Yeah. I, I, for a number of reasons, like, first of all, I have an incredibly low pain tolerance, like incredibly low. It's why I got clean so young without like ruining my life is like, I just, I want a lot. I have big ambitions. I, I, I know I have great talent. And by not, like another side, like what Jason Paris was saying is like, why does he continue to do what he's doing? 
think, well, you've been given all this opportunity. Like, like I believe in that. Like, if you want to call it karma or whatever you want to, like, I, my job is to, like, do the most with what I've been given. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, so if, if I have all these, like, extreme talents in a few areas, like, is doing the most with what I'm given – best use like going over here to these like few weaknesses and like trying to get them up to like passing Mm -hmm. like i don't know maybe maybe but i that's not been the the mode that i've taken and Mm -hmm. it's not what i would recommend to people Mm -hmm. because there's there's a bunch of people out there that are have strengths in areas you have weakness like yeah what are you talking about i mean that's echoed by almost every single successful business owner that I've ever heard interviewed. It's yes. <laughs> most I, and people I've don't to listen thousands to of them. Yeah. But it, it seems to be like top five things that anyone who's made it says um, you have to delegate at, at a certain point. I, the part I, we were talking, I listened to the first 45 minutes. I think you're Jason Paris one, but you know, a big thing that he always talks about is how he put great people in those positions and empowered them. I mean, this isn't rocket. The concepts aren't rocket science. No, executing it seems to be kind of elusive for most of us. But I, I think, I think a a fair amount of what's held back, just say the like the the avatar person painter, whatever some painter. I think it's safe to say a fair amount of what's held them back is has just been not a, not like lack of access to these ideas. Honestly, you know, yeah. A lot of times, I think that is a cop out, mm-hmm. but I think in this case, like. Yeah, like I I wasn't exposed to the co- these types of concepts being a reality for a painter to, to think about and to solve problems with. Like yeah. So just just starting there and like changing your paradigm I think is huge. Um you know, th- that education will go a long way. Yeah. You know, it will make up for a lot of other weaknesses just a deeper understanding of truths and reality. So, you know, I, I think there are some people, I mean, I'm guilty of it where there's a tendency to, to stay there for too long, right. To, to, to read too many books and not practice any of what you learned. Right. We've all been there, but there's also plenty of people who just haven't, you know, digested the information yet. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's why I think what you're doing here and, and what I do and what a lot of people do by like putting this stuff out here, you know, I would have killed to hear this stuff. I would have listened to every episode that you produce, that Nick produces, that anyone produces. Mm-hmm. There was years of me staring at paint reading. I feel like we've talked about this, how we came yeah. up on paint talk and yes. oh my God, it, I thought we probably both thought it was the only option. And Oh my! I don't know. I interviewed Scott Burt uh, earlier this season. He's a local Vermont guy. He was the king of paint talk. He was oh, like yeah. half the reason I, I learned anything on that. Scott is a was a major influence. I I when I met him, it was like meeting a famous person, and he probably yeah. thought I was a nut. Yep, I know he did. I rem- I re- remember exactly where we were, and and <laughs> I I uh, he remembers it too, which is hilarious because I was such a nut, and I was just like, this guy's amazing. You know, I I never met a pa- a painter who had a, a brain and really cared and was pushing the limits. Yes. And I was like, oh my gosh, you you exist, yeah. and I want more, and I want more, and and it was like it was super. It was not a very potent way to learn, right? There was a lot of crap you had to deal with to get anything out of paint talk. Mm-hmm. Where now, like, you get to go to this like super potent information. Yeah. You know it and. I mean, what we're doing right here is like it's, it's brilliant. Like, I'm not saying what we are like, but like the technology and the, and the capacities. Yes. I mean, <laughs> like, yeah. what did we do to get ready for this? We t- opened up our computers and we pushed mm-hmm. a button, and now we are recording a conversation that can be listened to in perpetuity. Yep. Yep. No, it's super powerful. Uh, along those lines, are you slash Carney thinking about documenting the process of creating the behind the scenes, the new and improved behind the scenes of ZK? Is that going to be documented and shared like you document everything else? Yes. Um, it's that's so I 
another selfish plug. I do a, a private podcast on um, Q and A on Sunday nights on mm-hmm. Patreon. Mm-hmm. Um, that is where that's happening. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's happening sort of real time. Uh, it's so that that Sunday night live show is sort of a combination of like it's like half like just straight behind the scenes. Like here's a thirty minute like deep dive into like what or like very introspective like here's what happened mm-hmm. that you didn't see on Instagram this week. Cool, right? It's like hey, Phil just gave me his two weeks notice two hours ago. Now let me talk about it. Right. Oh, wow. That was last week's. So last yeah, week's yeah. episode, you know, and and then the week before, like, what was the week before? A, a couple. We we won a we secured a very large contract. Mm-hmm. We secured, or, or and then we have a lead on a much larger one, and it, it's a crazy lead from a guy. Supposedly, there's a client in Spain who's been following us. Very successful man. Wow. Bought a very large home. He's going to do a very large project on it, and he has requested that we do the painting and he's going to interview three of the top GCs in New England, but we're going to do the painting. Right. Wow. Like I found that out like, like the Saturday night before I do the show and it's like, all right, no, not. So like, it's just it's very like inside baseball. Here's what's happening. I treat it like it's a private group, even though it's semi-private, anyone can join the Patreon, but that is, a, that is the place where I've chosen to, because I'm very, I'm very into, when content create when content creation, what's going to be easy, and 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 will allow me to keep doing this. Mm-hmm. So my live show is I record it, I post it, I don't think about it again. Mm-hmm. Like that's the extent of the work it takes is the the you know twenty thirty minutes of prep time I do ahead of time, and the show, and then it's done. If I were to do anything more than that, I wouldn't continue to do it. Sure. And so the same thing is true. Like, yeah, would it be awesome if I was like really consciously documenting all this stuff in a very like formal way? It'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. But again, like it's so much easier for me to turn on, open up a computer screen and like answer questions and talk for two hours every Sunday night. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in a way it's being recorded. Sure. Is the, is Patreon archived archiving these episodes? Okay. So people can go back and watch Watch or listen to the entire. Yeah, day. unfortunately, my the the early adopters, the the late adopters get a huge advantage. If you if you join tomorrow, you get all the last ones for the same price as you know because it's a monthly subscription. You pay to be a patron, and then there's you have access to all of these live videos that are done through uh, another online streaming platform called Crowdcast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's turned out to be, I was just getting burned out and frustrated. And I've answered the same question hundreds of times now, numbers of questions, hundreds of times. And I was, I was doing a Sunday night Q and a every night and I, you know, wasn't really getting any ROI out of it except for, you know, it felt good to give back, mm-hmm. but that only will take you so far. Sure. And so just to justify it to my, myself, my wife, like, what are you doing taking your Sunday night and for two hours talking? Like I'm not a single dude. I have a wife. I love her. I love spending time with her. And it's like, okay, we have this awesome weekend. Like, Hey babe, I got to do my, my show. Yeah. So just by simply putting a $15 paywall up, um, I find that it's a really awesome group and the questions are amazing. Mm-hmm. And it's, I still treat it privately. I know my clients, if they wanted to, could sign up and watch them. I don't see that happening anytime soon. It seemed too likely. So, because it's, because of the few little hurdles, I feel very safe. Honestly, I'm probably way too open there. Uh, we That may come back to bite me, but it's a cool place to be like very behind the scenes. And so all of this stuff gets to be shared there. Mm-hmm. Cool. I, I did want to ask about that. I had seen it, but hadn't investigated it much. Is that I'm, I'm a complete novice at Patreon. Is that, that's like a website, so you can be watching that on your phone. You can be watching that just on your browser. Can you get that anywhere? You can watch it on your phone. There's an app. So there's a Patreon app, and then there's a, a Crowdcast app. So Patreon, Crowdcast allows you to live stream, and they allow you to either put a, a, 
like you can only a password on the live stream or you can put a you can put the link out so you have to have the link to go to the live stream you can put it public or you can have it be for patron patreon members so i can just set i make a uh like there's already one up for the sunday night there's a notification hey there's a live coming on sunday night and if you're a patreon member you would get automatic access to it and you can subscribe to the crowdcast like notifications so you just get them and then you can go back and watch them all so it's like patreon is a way to you can do lots of stuff with patreon i'm not utilizing it like that i'm just usually utilizing it as a a gate that keeps people to make something over the other side slightly private sure that makes sense as we close out, is there anything else you want to plug? We've talked about. Did we cover ZK Finishing School in the way yeah, you wanted I, to? I think ZK Finishing School is something I'm really proud of it because I think it adds more value than any business I've ever created. Like mm. the twenty five hundred dollars to come to ZKFS will save you tens of thousands and hundreds of hours. Like mm. it will just absolute rocket fuel shortcut the learning curve by an immense amount of time. And you don't have to believe me. Ask all the people who we take group photos of everyone who's ever come. That my best salespeople are people who have come. Um, I'm very, very like this is a side thing, and it's for other yeah. painters. And I need to make sure that this is adding extreme value to the market. I'm not too proud to say it. I will watch the stories of people at ZK Finishing School because it looks like so much fun. And the only thing preventing me from coming down is that I'm trying to just get away from the craft stuff and more on the business stuff. There's nothing I would love more than to be down there doing that. It looks like so much social fun. media class then, because that can you, is. Can you talk about more, more about like what's covered there. Yeah, so I I'll go through the itinerary. The itinerary is up on our Instagram, mm -hmm. but actually, before I do that, I don't think I told my wife. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Whatever you gotta do, man. So the itinerary is, and this was another like fun, the first time you're around, you're like, you get it pretty good. I, so I have like a PhD now <laughs> at Instagram and how it works and like how to turn it into a revenue generating source for your business. Right. Mm -hmm. I have, I've spent more hours probably on the, almost as many hours on that in a few short years that I have obsessing on how to get gloss to look good. Mm -hmm. And, and it, so it, it's harder to see. I mean, I guess you can see we have a, a, a lot of fair amount of followers, but when you see the revenue that's coming from it, that's where it's like, well, holy crap. That, that guy in Spain you just mentioned. I mean, yeah. Like, okay. So insane. CEO in Spain. Yeah. Bought a, you know, many million dollar house and is going to do a many million dollar renovation. And he's interviewing the top GCs in New England. But is, in, is saying that he wants the only person he named was ZK Painting because he watches us on Instagram. Next up. Okay. Yeah. So anyone who is questioning anything about social media being powerful, I could tell you 10 more stories like that. That's the crazy thing. Like I have they they come out every every day. And and what happens is these people are not shopping for painters. Right? He's not sure. These people are they want us. Right, mm -hmm. we have decommoditized our service mm -hmm. that allows us to charge what it costs to be truly profitable and not to lose money doing great work. Mm -hmm. And this is universal, so it's because that's what we teach at the class. So, we so we go over, we build a social media blueprint that for every individual company, so we keep it to six companies at the class so that it, it is a, a very much a back and forth, back and forth. And ideas are being generated. People do some work. They write things down. They, they brainstorm, they come back, they read their ideas and we go back and forth, back and forth as people hone in on their messaging, the types of messages that, or first of all, why you, what, what are we trying to say with this? Right. Mm -hmm. Very misunderstood. Like you have to have the big picture first. So what are our competitive advantages? Why us? This is the drum we're going to beat all the day, every day. 
And if we beat this drum long enough, it's going to, like the Pied Piper, it's going to attract all the people who want those things, sure. right? And then we're going to go, well, what are the types of posts that we can create that will highlight those things? And that's where people really, people have a, a, a somewhat difficult time getting to their competitive advantages. Surprise, not surprisingly, but that's a tough thing for people to do a little bit. People will really struggle with this next step. And the last one, they struggle, I found more than I thought they would, but they struggle with going, well, what are the types of ways I could highlight these competitive advantages? Mm -hmm. People tend to be, it's, it's a, it's a creative endeavor. It requires lots of time spent on social media, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And like, I've, I've honed this to be this, like so many things are innate in me that I realized they weren't four years ago when I started, like they were very, very difficult and very, very like, so we, we, we start to go, well, how can we demonstrate these things? Right. How do we demonstrate that you have um, lots of experience, right? Okay, so you, your company has been established for a long time. Well, I can't compete with that, right? That's a built-in true competitive advantage. You can't, I can't. If I start a company tomorrow, I cannot all of a sudden manufacture 20 years experience. All right, so that's a true competitive advantage. That is something I want to highlight because most guys can't say that. Okay, so now how do I do it? Uh, like... And, and there, that's where you, it's like, we need to get creative on what are the ways that we could highlight this, right? We could do a weekly throwback where we went to old jobs, highlighted them. We could go to do another one where we just talked about all the repeat clients. Like here's, here's the repeat clients. We like, what are the other creative ways that we could do it? We could take vintage photos. We could, there, this is what has to happen. And we have to do this for all the different things that we're trying to say. Now we have, what are we trying to say? Here's the types of posts we're making. And then we go, okay, this is where people struggle the most is like, all right, well, now I need you to make me 10 posts. Just write down what is the picture going to be of? I don't need the picture. What is the picture going to be of? Write me a caption. And that generally people struggle with that writing, right? And voice. Like this is what we need to have a voice. If you read my captions, they're very clearly ZK painting captions. They came like, and they're very targeted. Like they speak to my ideal client most often. They also speak to other painters sometimes. And they a lot of times they're going to answer questions that I don't want to answer 20 times in the comments. Sure. But but they're structured in a way, they're very intentional. And and the, like everything's very intentional. What type of posts I put on reels versus what type of posts I put on IGTV versus what I put on stories versus what I put on my feed. All, there's just a lot of intention there. Mm -hmm. And... So we go, we spend the whole weekend doing that. We go into, we spend a lot of time on content creation. How do we shoot video? How do we edit video? And how do we do it in a timely manner that doesn't require, you know, tons of effort and tons of time. And we do the same thing for photos. And um, by the time you leave, now you go home with a very clear blueprint. And what that does is it makes it something you're actually going to go do. Yeah. Hopefully. Because... If you wake up every day and you have to be truly creative and make a post and write a good caption and all that stuff, that requires a lot of energy. If you have a framework to work within and ideas that like that becomes a way less of a difficult thing. And then what really the beauty of what happens is you start to beat the same drum all day, every day. Consistency is what wins on Instagram. No one post will do anything for you ever. It's not about that. It's about consistent messaging over and over and over again. So I start to know who you are, what you stand for, and I trust you, right? It's about building trust. This guy, I've never met him, but he trusts us so much, he's insisting that we do the work. Well, you don't do that with any one or two posts. You do that with consistent messaging over and over again that has it's part of a bigger plan. So... That's kind of what we do, and we spend a weekend doing it. Yeah, and that is really comprehensive. Yeah. Do you find it's more tailored to the higher-end outfits that are already doing the kind of sexier work, or do you have more middle-of-the-road people as well? Yeah. yeah. The, because this is a universal thing. Every com Any successful company has to have competitive advantages. They have to have a value, value proposition. And so whatever – and then if they beat that drum or they whistle that whistle – or, the, or the, was it the fiddle or whatever? Like, 
the piper that if they if they play that music, sure. their ideal clients are going to come. Sure. So we all have ideal clients. We all have competitive advantages and we all have unique value propositions. Mm-hmm. So, no, it's a that's the beauty of this is it's universal. Cool. And the fact that I have 40,000 followers is not what's doing this. That's irrelevant. I could be doing this exact same thing with 3,000. Like, it's not about volume of followers. It's about, I mean, because let's be honest, of okay, all that revenue is going to come from 12 or 15 people. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's really not about that. It, and so, yes, I, it's incredibly universal. Mm. and But it's even harder for those people who aren't doing the sexy stuff. Mm-hmm. See, right? Because what is your competitive advantages? And how people don't think to highlight those on Instagram. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because if you're not highlighting the beauty, what are you, if you're not highlighting the beauty, what are you focusing on? Exactly. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how about we're really fast in and out? How about we're very cost effective? You know, how about we're very custom? We can do lots of, like, I don't, what is it? I don't care what it is. If I, if you tell me what, name something, I can start riffing a million ideas on how to highlight that. Mm. Right. So you, so these kind of, these more like idea based things, you feel like you have a way to turn them into tangible, like image or video based things. I I tend, I have found, I have a talent for this. Okay. It's, it's, it's a talent, but it's also been a lot of muscle flexing. I've, 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 I've built a number of businesses, social media accounts in my social media marketing company. So I have experience starting a company that has zero posts and has no presence on social media and like Armstrong Clark. Like I started Armstrong Clark's account from scratch Mm. and I coached up college kids to create the content, which, which is very difficult. They don't know anything about stain. And we built a following over time. Mm -hmm. And then, then fairly quickly after that, my partner and I, we, we weren't getting along different visions. He's a great guy, incredibly talented. And so he bought me out of the company and they've continued on. And they're that most of the social media that marketing that they do is food and beverage businesses. But I've, I've started a lot. I've seen a lot. I've taken boring companies like, and I've taken, you know, and so I understand that it, like, and I study marketing, like basic marketing, you can market any like toothpaste. Dude, toothpaste has been incredibly well marketed over the years, right? It's not that sexy. Nope. But good intentional marketing, it still always works. Mm. So yeah, I I I've I've gotten I wish more people took it seriously. Mm-hmm. Like seriously. Yeah. People they, they post. Everyone just posts. I wish more people took it seriously because I did and I don't think I'm a fluke. Maybe my overall following is not going to be reproducible. Well, I can tell you it's not unless you started five years ago because it's harder and harder to gain following every day. Yeah. So you're not going to grow unless you start making viral videos left and right. Um, like very gay paint. Do you follow them on Instagram? No. Oh, my God. Those guys are absolute gold. And they're very gay blowing. paint. Very gay <laughs> paint. They're, these two gay guys in California, they do – the funniest reels you've ever seen. They're hysterical. <laughs> Their captions are like out of this world. They're so hilarious. And they're blowing up. Are they but actual painters or is this a shtick? No, they, they are mural painters. They, they do like, they use tape lines and they just did this whole deal with Kelly Wrestler and Pharaoh and Ball. And they like, I think they started their account like five months ago and they have 60 something thousand followers. That's and awesome. they'll be at a hundred in no time. Yeah, they're they're very they're rare, you know, and they're tied. Now they're getting rocket fueled by having all these famous people. But mm-hmm. you don't need followers. You need clients. Like you need revenue. You need leads. Follower number is not what it's about. I don't care about my following. That's not that's not the number I care about. If I didn't have revenue coming from it, I have five hundred fifty thousand followers on TikTok. Or now it's 548,000 because I haven't done anything on TikTok in months. No revenue comes from TikTok. I'm all set. TikTok has gotten zero calories since I have had a come to Jesus moment. And it was like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Okay, time to stop. But yeah, I mean, I think 
I hope I would love to see. We just had a second group of people. Um, and I'm really excited to see how people go home and implement. Um, but I've seen, I've seen it work for our past people. How often do you alternate between the marketing class versus the, the fine paints application class? So we have, I'm, I'm taking a big risk here, but I'm, I'm planning on doing social media once a month and FPE once a month. And what we're doing is we're stacking them. So Thursday, Friday is social media. Saturday, Sunday is FPE. So if people do try decide to travel across the country and they want to come to both, they don't have to do it in two trips. Cool. Um, We've not had any, well, this last weekend was the first time we've done that. And it just worked out where no one did both. We had six people did one, six people did a different. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had a lot of repeat, a lot, a number of the people who came last to social media have already come to, to the FPE, mm -hmm. which to me is like the, the best sign. We've had a lot of repeats. Mm -hmm. um, we have the wallpaper installation class is next month as well. Yeah, I saw that. I, do, you, do you lead that? No. Okay. I didn't think David Cook is going to lead that. Okay. Uh, he's like a master installer. He spent, he's a guy who spent a lot of time thinking about this and wanting to do this and just never did it. Mm -hmm. So he already had, when I reached out to him, he already had Google Docs like out the wazoo. I mean, this guy has thought this through. Sure. And then I'm taking sort of my experience of, of, I love Seth Godin. I don't know if you, listen to his podcast it's like the best one ever and he always talks about learning versus education and mm. and so we want real learning here and so how do we get real learning and i've done this enough now where i think i'm i'm getting very good at people leaving and actually learning something and not just leaving and having been educated at um so we've we have been we went through we built an itinerary uh we try to keep it very simple right concepts if I go two in the weeds while you're here and you go home, it's going to be a lot harder to actually put these things to practice. But I get, if you get concepts that you can go home and practice, that's a very different story, right? Because in two days, I can't teach you the, enough to actually make you go home and replicate. But in two days, I can teach you how to think about things, how to approach things, and how to actually get predictable results through training. Mm -hmm. So yeah, David Cook's going to come out. Uh, that class is like, I think April 24th and 25th or something like that. It's a, it's on the Instagram, mm -hmm. but he's going to teach a two day class with one of his leads and we're just going to help facilitate it. We have a, a facility now. We just expanded to our shop and we're going to be building out full scale room, mock rooms with mm -hmm. doors, windows, crown molding so that we can hang paper in that. Right. And cool. how do you hang paper around a light switch? How do you hang paper around a, you know, a fire detector, smoke detector? All those things. Do you see that angle of the finishing school model? Like you kind of subcontracting the teaching out, expanding more to other subcategories and related yes. trades and concepts? That, that's I'm very really powerful. Because we have a plaster person that we've been in talks with. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I think that my goal for – so it's funny. Have you ever heard of the – when they talk – like the best entrepreneurs – Kevin Kelly is one of my favorite guys in, in – I think it was him. It was talked about like giving, like if you have a great idea, give it away. And if nobody does anything with it, then go make it happen. So that's kind of what happened with the school. Like I, I kind of, a friend of mine had was starting a school and I was like, dude, here's exactly what I do. Here's like, I'm a contractor. I'm here to be your client. Here's what I would do. You got to do these things. You got to be the best at teaching. You gotta be so much better at teaching than I am that I want to send my people to you, right? Obsess, read books, study teaching, right? If you can do that, I'm happy to pay you to teach my guy because you know how to teach better than me. So that's what we're trying to do at ZKFS is perfect like real learning. Like how do we teach people so they actually learn? And how do we do it in a short period of time? And so, you know, our competitive advantages are with we are small. It's six companies max every time. Sometimes people bring multiple people from a company and those people are half the price, but we generally won't have more than eight, but it's six companies and it's all very, very hands-on, right? There are, I don't know, good or bad, there are other places you can go who will put 30 people in a room and 
it'll be one day and they'll lecture to you. Maybe they'll touch a tool once or twice. And I'm not saying good or bad, but I know, well, I know I can tell you that that's not going to, you're not going to learn nearly as much that way as through hands-on, right. right? Do my classes cost a lot more? Yeah, they do. Cause they're small, but I've just gone like, I'm going to keep it small and I'm going to make real change. Like my goal for everyone who comes is it's like a massive trajectory change for the rest of their career. Yeah. Right. Not like a rah, rah. That's fun. Awesome weekend. I go home as an invigorated painter now. Yeah. There's plenty of those. Yep. Um, but what, yeah. So we're working on getting a system where we can bring in skilled people and still have real learning. So we essentially, what that means is we're going to take their skills and then we're going to help them deconstruct their skills in a way that we can teach. So that's what I did with David. I, I was like, okay, I don't know how to do wallpaper. So let's break this down into the two or three, four core things that I'm going to need to know and go home so I can actually do wallpaper. Mm-hmm. If I get, if we get two in the weeds on any one topic, the whole weekend's wasted. So that's where like, I see the, the vision for this is that that's where like we can take super skilled people and we can deconstruct the core concepts and then use our systems to teach. I love so, that. Yeah. That's it's very yeah, that's exciting. A powerful model. Like I, I mean, I hope that is scalable and lasting because I, it is. like that's yeah. the thing is that's yeah. scalable. Yeah. My goal is yes. We want to have training facilities around the country, yeah. right? So that you don't have to fly to Rhode Island every time. Cause I will tell you, I'm way more into that than I am going online. Mm-hmm. I have been very resistant to going to online classes, even though I've been inundated with people who want us to. Mm -hmm. The one I'm considering doing, and I probably will, is the social media class. Mm. I I, I believe we may be offering an online version of the social media class. Mm -hmm. Because nothing is technically hands-on. So I can feel confident being remote. I I will say I, I don't think it's as good because humans for eight hours, two days staring at a screen. It's not the same experience. Yeah. It, you know, I'm taking, um, Nick May's roadmap to roadmap to profit right now. And like, I went to his crank. Um, and it's, it's different, but I still like it. And I still think there's value added. And I don't know. Like I could see a FPE gloss door online class where, you know, there's, there's all the the modules and whoever's yeah. taking it at home buys a Dutch door kit and does it at their own pace. I, I can see that landing. And I, yeah, I don't know if you're wrong. Yeah. I, you could be, I I'll tell you, well, first of all, I'll tell you that doesn't get me going. Like, no, <laughs> just like the idea of selling a thousand courses to people and not having that because let's, so, so if we break down teaching, like, it's like, I demonstrate, then I show, then you do, then I correct, then you do, right? I, like, if there's not a, if it doesn't go back, forth, back, forth, like, because I, I can't tell you, the, if I, the list goes on and on, the number of little things that will fundamentally mess you up that I've been able to see, like, this, when someone grabs a gun and goes to spray a sample board, I've already explained all the things in great detail, and I've demonstrated. I mean... Almost everyone has little things they need to have tweaked. Mm-hmm. Well, if this is an online course, you might just solidify bad habits for life. And so right now I, I, I am having a hard time. Do I think I could sell a lot of them and probably make a lot of money doing it? Mm-hmm. I probably, I probably could. Do I care at all about that? Like, no, that's not what I started this for. Like, cause that won't last, right? That will be short money. I, what I care about is, truly teaching people mm. so that they actually learn and then actually implement and then it actually changes their business. And so if that's what my core values, if that's my goal, right now online learning is really hard for me to wrap my head around. <laughs> I even though I, like I, I take your point, I will say again, to devil's advocate from the consumer standpoint. I know everyone's I still that. think if you know if one of those modules was 10 top 10 things that I see everyone screw up and needs the most, most correction on. 
and you get a contractor who, you know, skilled, good, good learner can kind of troubleshoot the other stuff on their own. I still think that's value added, but no, it is. If, it is if it's not what gets you out of bed. Then hey, that's that's so that's where like I'm quite certain when we build that place out over there, and it's a beautiful. We're building it out to teach, but it's also being built out. Yes, for to record, right? We yes, I I'm not saying I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm saying that I'm adding way too much value to, and there's too many people who want to come. And until that max is out or until I find some more free time, I'm just not ready to go online yet, sure. but it may happen. But I'll tell you what the difference between watching videos and especially, especially for people in the trades, right? Some certain people are better at staring at screens and digesting content than other people. Mm-hmm. And I think guys who work with their hands, not the top of the list of people who want to watch a of an eight hour video series on painting mm-hmm. like that same eight hours here gets the synapses firing there's back and forth so yeah i i know and i get so much pushback and a lot of guys can't come to you though that's, i know that's, i know would love to pay 500 bucks to do it in their basement in california at their own pace i know i'm gonna have to do it but <laughs> But right now, as long as we can get six contractors a month to come, that covers what we need it to cover, makes us a profitable entity, and it will come. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying it's apples apples and apples. It's not. No, it's the, definitely the not. in person is always going to be 10 times better. You're going to meet lifelong friends. There's going to be yes. a before and after it's the point. community. We go to 100%. dinner with the owner of Fine Paints of Europe. Yes. Like, oh, my God. Yes. That is always better. That is the sommelier giving you the wine. But a lot of us still like a nice bottle of wine over, you know, at home, you know, you're right. And, you and I, I appreciate this feedback because you're another data point yeah. that I cannot deny the, the crafts, the, the, the part of me that's running away from the craftsmanship trap that I love getting caught in would let me spend 500 bucks and do it at my own pace at my own house. Whereas it's like, I, I, so every part of me wants to pay the full price and come down for the weekend, but that's not my best choice right now for where I'm no. headed. No, but, and, and yes, I think you're right, but the social media class, that's undeniably in line with what you're trying to do. Sure. I, I think, I think for most, like I said before, whether or not I teach a social media class, I'm like for most guys, sales and market, Tim Perryman was on my podcast. And when I asked him, What's the nut first thing people should do when they're new and starting out? He was like, instantly said, sales and marketing. Because mm-hmm. you can be the fastest painter in the world. If you don't have any work or you got to work at horrible prices, <sighs> you know, yeah. I'm a perfect example of, of, I mean, we are, Nick Slavic would roll over and, and, and he, if he, like, if Slav, like Slavic and like Nick from NWR, like if they knew, I mean, they kind of do because I tell them, but if, like if they ever saw how inefficient we are as a company that, you know, but we give a great experience and we sell, I sell jobs for a ton of money. Mm-hmm. And so it makes up for that. And that's, that's where I would say, like, don't underestimate the power of sales and marketing to take stress away from your life. Mm-hmm. No, I take that point loud and clear. I I feel like I should just let you go home, man. I could sit here all night. <laughs> My wife just goes, uh, <laughs> what did she say? Oh, well, LOL. I thought I was a widow. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Um, Kenny, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, she's awesome. She's amazing. I, that's like another huge piece of this. Like I have an amazingly supportive spouse. Um, you know, and I don't, I couldn't do it without her. You know, she doesn't care about the business. Like she's like, don't, I don't, she's a scientist. She's like, I don't need to hear about painting. Generally. She like, she, uh, that's to be fair. She will listen. She's a very good listener. Mm-hmm. But you know, as far as like being involved in the business, like. We are down a really deep rabbit hole. That's kind of hard to communicate to people outside of it. I think at this point, just embedded in this community. Most people don't understand that there's even a community of painters who like 
talks to each other. Like ha- having to explain to outsiders that I'm going to a paint conference. Like there's, like it is, it's impossible to explain. I get laughed at, and it's like, no, this is like one of the best parts of my year professionally. Like, yeah. Then to add on this, the insane amount of invigorating satisfaction that I get from talking to a bunch of other painters for a weekend about paint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a painting podcast. Oh, you teach people how to paint on your podcast. Well, no, like that wouldn't work. Well, then what do you do? What could you possibly be talking about? It, it, from the outside perspective, like good luck. It's got to be a spouse or something. They got to care enough to get to know you, to yeah. to go even ten percent down that rabbit hole with you. Totally. Um. All right. Any other closing thoughts, that Kenny? No, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, because do I have more thoughts, dude? Don't oh, get no, of course. Clearly, I, again, I could keep going. We could do a round I, two. I have two. I have thoughts for days, man. They don't they don't stop. <laughs> um, that's why I produce as much content as I produce, and, and that's correct. where I if I didn't do the Q and A on Sunday nights on Patreon, I I it might in hindsight it probably it's very therapeutic. Uh, I've actually a few times I've made the joke that I owe them copays. Um, but when in, when you interview somebody, especially a lot of like when I'm interviewing people now, like I just pretty much guide a conversation and, and have to, I ask questions. I, I interject a little bit, but for the most part you are, you're interviewing somebody. That's the format that I've come up with. And so it is nice to have that, two hours of just like, I'm going to riff. And I, so I did four days of ZKFS after I just had, I had lip surgery the week before. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I would, I'd been out and I'd been resting and I'd been felt really bad like Monday, Tuesday. And I knew I had four days straight of talking and teaching with a lip that could, you know, had been chopped open. And so I, I, I finished four days straight and Sunday I finished at four, five o'clock. And 5.30. And I got home, had dinner, hung out with my wife for a minute, and I got on my podcast at 8.30. I was like, I'm not, I, I can't miss. I have new patrons this week. Like, I can't miss. I got on on pain medication the night, the weekend before, like right after my surgery. And I was on for like 20 minutes. I don't know how long I forgot. Uh, I don't remember any of it. You know, that's what I say, like being vulnerable. Like you want to, I haven't been high in over five and a half years. If you want to see like me with legally high on pain meds that I needed, there's an episode of ZKFS of ZK Live where I was like on pain meds and I don't remember what I said. But have you rewatched you know, it? No, I haven't actually. Okay. I should. People people have mentioned stuff to me about it. Like they thought it was very entertaining. Um, but that like I got to eight thirty on Sunday after a gauntlet going out to dinner each like on the nights of the, sh- of the, the school. And like, and I, if you watched last week's episode, I'm nuts. There's two hours of just like, you know, have you ever listened to Bill Burr's podcast? Uh, I've listened to his comedy, not his podcast. It's Bill so Burr has a podcast and he inspired me actually to do the Q and a, the really? solo because Bill Burr has a podcast that doesn't have guests. And he freeform riffs for two hours once a week. And the concept of that does not sound very funny, right? A guy just talking into a microphone with no, and in his case, with no topic, right? But it's hysterical. And you start riffing and you, you know, like if I, I can talk, obviously, like I'm a talker and people get me going and ideas get me going and, and I'll just like, bop, 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 and, and just riffing and joke. i full of ridiculous comedy to myself that only makes me laugh probably. And it, it's like such a fun outlet. Um, that's my sales pitch for, for the Patreon. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a funny inspiration. I, I would not have guessed that. But yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where it's either going to be horrible or awesome to have those recordings in five years when I have kids, you know, bearing my soul. Yeah. I have to think it's going to be good, but you know, it's also dangerous. I think all that stuff is really valuable to archive. Um, 
Because then you can look back in three years and be like, remember that day when that happened? And then I just went on and I was bummed and I just, it, but. Yeah, I I've had that. tough ones. Yeah. I've had, because, you know, running a business is an insane roller coaster. Mm-hmm. And I've had days, real tough days. And and then the podcast will come around and, and I get to share in that forum. I get to share about, you know, being depressed or being like, just feeling like you got punched in the gut seven times and what am I doing this for? And questioning your, like, I'm a loser. I should stop. Right. I think anyone in business has had that thought, even if however fleeting we've all thought I'm a, I'm a complete, I'll, I'll, I'll just say I have, I'll say I've had plenty of instances where I'm like, I'm a complete failure. I don't know what I'm doing. I should quit and go do something else. Right. And, you know, I think that it's valuable to share the, those types of things because the one problem with Instagram is it's for my business. So it is very professional. It's honest and professional, but it's also for my business. It is not what my private Zach running a painting company, what's it like to go through it. That's a very different podcast on Sunday nights. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, in hindsight, that one specifically would be very valuable to, to see like, you know, anytime you see anyone that you think is successful and then you get to get to know them, it's like, oh, they're a human being. Well, just because we have a, a, a good following on social media and we get to do awesome stuff, like stuff's hard, you know, and there's downs. I think the real value of that is something I try to promote with what I'm doing. I, I don't want to hear exclusively guys with their really smooth running businesses who've made it, who have time to talk about it and everything's like... I actually want to see the nitty gritty sometimes. I want to see what it feels like in the moment at the ground level. Like that needs to be cataloged more or as much as the yeah, really neat When I interview problem. those people, that is my goal. Like I told Jason Paris, word for the last, I was like, man, like I'm here to make you human, right? Yeah. You, you are superhuman to our community. Yeah. And I'm here to show, I'm sorry, but I, that's my job is to get to what is, J, who is Jason Paris? Yeah. And I'm interviewing you. Mm-hmm. Like I need to hear like the things that make you real, which are mistakes, you know, head trash, down moments, I, like all those things. Like, yeah, because then I can go, well, if Jason Paris did it, I can do it too. Yes. But if yeah. I only hear all awesome stuff all the time, I, I can't relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's from that perspective, which I appreciate very much. He's a tough nut to crack because he is very polished and just insanely together. And I can't wait to, to listen oh, I got to the rest it. of that well, one. I will say I had a huge advantage. Nature gave me a huge advantage and that I think he was just physically tired. He was exhausted. The guy he posts <laughs> every morning at 5 a.m. He's swimming. So – I think I had hit, I got him. It's the most, probably one of my, it is, it's the most recent one. I think it's my best interview because I'm getting better every time. I'm, I'm proud of the interview that I did with him. Yeah. I, I'll see that here. I wouldn't say it, but like, you know, like, yeah, I feel, I felt like Jason is the kind of guy that I've had conversation with him, but I don't feel like I, I got to know him. Like he's just so deep and complex, Yeah. but like, you know, he's Jason. And I, I didn't get deep, but I got deep enough. Good. Where I Good. was like, oh, man, this is freaking brilliant. Yeah. He's just such an inspirational person to me personally. He yes. has inspired me on so many levels. I, I have so much respect for Jason Paris. Mm-hmm. So it was an honor to get to interview him, you know, and get to know him better. Um, he's just he's one of my favorite people. I, he's honestly, I think he's the funniest person I know. Oh yeah, that I'm I'm in the four percent that thinks he's hilarious or whatever he says or whatever he calls it the four percent. Yeah, no, I'm in that one. No, he's he's brilliant. I'm glad he's on the interview circuit a little more right now. Uh, I think the world should know him a little better. So yeah, I can't wait to can't wait to finish that one. Um, all right, man, I'm calling it. You got to get home to your wife. <laughs> I've I've crushed five seltzers while we sit here. I I need to go re up. <laughs> Yeah, or get some dinner. Um, Zach, thank you so much for making the time and sitting down. I think uh, I think this is an important conversation amongst so many you have. And I appreciate it, man. 
Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. And for those of you who are watching the video, this is uh, the one and only NK Live signing out. The little sign behind me. And next week, I'll be back with Nick May in the business bucket and we'll bastardize his brand. So <laughs> over and out.